in Wallala, Monday through Friday, October 25th through October 29th. That's Linden Design Gallery at 1000 Annapolis Road, open on Saturdays from 11 to 4. And this is KGUA in Wallala, 88.3 FM, and it is the second day of the third annual Ocean Life Symposium. For three hours each day this week, from 9 a.m. to noon, we are going to be hearing from 19 local and national ocean experts and citizen scientists who will talk about the health and future of our oceans and the life forms within them. I'm one of your hosts and the co-producer, Leanne Lindsay, along with co-producers and ocean life founders, Scott and Tree Mercer of Mindanoma Whale and Seal Study and KGUA host, George Callis, Paul Mundy in the background, Peggy Berryhill, also in the background, and other team members here today are, include Roberta Chan and Jean Berry. Our studios are located on the Pacific Ocean in the South Mendocino coastal town of Guadalajara, California. The sponsors are the Sea Ranch Lodge, Lisburg and Company Realtors, Surf Market, the Sea Ranch Supply, and CNA Metalworks, and Thai Kitchen in Anchor Bay. You can listen live online at kgua.org, and you can watch all the presentations live or later at your leisure on YouTube. I even listened yesterday's show on my car speakers that was connected to Bluetooth to my phone. I pulled up the YouTube video, and there I listened to it in the car. So if you sync your phone to your car via Bluetooth and have internet access, you can listen anytime to our great programming that we're going to have all week long for three hours each day. And the interactive speaker schedule is on our website and our app. Just go to kgua.org and you'll find both of those. And again, that is the Air Pocket app where you can listen in live anywhere and also see the speaker schedule. So here is George Callis. He's editor and founder at White Barn Press, and also editor of the Sea Ranch Soundings Magazine. Good morning, George. And hey, who do we have today? <laughs> good morning, Leanne. Wow, what a fantastic lineup we had yesterday. And as I reviewed the speakers today, I think we've got a, we're going to hit another home run. And uh, kicking off, or I should say first pitch, being thrown by Jen Kennedy. Jen's the executive director of the Blue Ocean Society. She's going to speak on a topic which is of interest to almost everybody these days, plastics and other debris in the marine environment. That's a hot topic, a right? A hot topic. Jen's the co-founder of the Blue Ocean Society. The Blue Ocean Society conducts marine debris research. They do education programs, community beach cleanups. They run Adopt-A-Beach programs, and they do microplastics research. Jen, give us some great information on this important issue. And welcome. Great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited about this. And um, it's a great idea what you guys are doing, streaming it live and uh, making it accessible to so many people. So, uh, so I was asked to come here today to talk about marine debris and talking a little bit about uh, the issues, the impact on marine life, and then some possible causes and solutions. So I'm the executive director and co-founder of Blue Ocean Society for Marine Conservation. We're based in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. So pretty far away from your studio and uh, got a lot of rain here today. It's pretty cold. Um, so um, probably going to have some marine debris coming onto our coast soon as well. So, um, and so we're an organization that has been working in New England for the last 20 years to study the whales that are off our coast and also uh, mitigate our human impacts on whales through beach cleanups, educational programs, uh, learning about the species that are off our coast. And while our programs are based here regionally in New England, a lot of the, the work that we do is done by similar organizations in other areas, or it's work that could be transferred to other areas wherever you happen to be listening. So I just want to state that right off the bat, if there's any projects that we're involved in or work that we're doing that interests you and you might like to incorporate into your own work, whether you're an individual that's looking to make a difference or an organization uh, looking to make some changes, uh, feel free to reach out to me and I would love to answer any questions you have or talk to you about any of our protocols that I'm talking about today. As far as the organization goes, we really got our start doing whale research in the Gulf of Maine, and uh, which is our part of the Atlantic Ocean. 
So trying to learn about the whales and the endangered species that are here. And, uh, but then really wanting to take the information that we were learning and get that to the public so that they could go out and make a difference. Even though, you know, water is really tied to the New England coastline. There's, you know, a long history of interaction with the water here through fishing and recreation and uh, lots of other ways. Uh, a lot of people don't get to the ocean as often as uh, they might want to or should and aren't really familiar with the marine life that are here. We have a really wide um, diversity of marine life here. And so a lot of our work is just trying to teach people kind of spark a fascination in the marine life that's here and then hopefully inspire some environmental stewardship and a desire to help protect these animals uh, when they're under threat and just try to create a healthier environment overall. One of the things we've been doing since the late 1990s is working on local whale watch boats. And uh, from there, of course, we're not just seeing people from New England, but people from all around the world. And so while a lot of the field work we do is local here to this region, uh, we're talking to a lot of people that can bring the information all over the place and hopefully teach others around the world about how important the ocean is to the health of all of us. And I think we're all learning that listening to this symposium and all the great speakers this week. We do have a uh, office in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. We also have a small educational facility called the Blue Ocean Discovery Center, which is in Hampton Beach, New Hampshire, where we have touch tanks and exhibits. And uh, it's a really impacted location, very touristy destination. So we try to get people into the center and teach them about the marine life and taking care of the beach before they go out and enjoy the beach during their week long vacation. And we've been doing a lot of uh, outreach to schools. We actually have a life-size inflatable whale that we bring to schools so that you can see in this picture if you're listening uh, on YouTube and can see the slides. And then we've also been involved in marine debris research and cleanup since 2001. So doing beach cleanups here in our area for over 20 years and then trying to use the information that we get when we're out cleaning the beaches and hopefully develop some solutions to this litter problem that we have. So marine debris is in the news a lot lately. You can also call it plastic pollution because a lot of the debris that's out there is plastic and pretty persistent. But in case you're not familiar, the really basic definition is it's trash that's found in or by the sea. There's lots of different, uh, more technolo technical definitions for marine debris, but basically stuff that's on the beach or out in the ocean that doesn't belong there. And you can probably think about walking on a beach and what you might find on there. And you can envision some typical marine debris items. Cigarette butts is a big one that annoys a lot of people. Uh, plastic cups, bottle caps, things like that that don't belong there. A lot of times when we're doing a beach cleanup, I even consider things that don't naturally occur there. Things like orange peels or banana peels. People have a picnic on the beach and they leave sometimes their fruit on the beach because it's biodegradable. But if it doesn't really belong there and doesn't grow there naturally, that's, I really consider marine debris as well. So it is one of the most widespread problems facing the world's oceans and waterways. The more we learn about marine debris, the more we're learning it is in all parts of the ocean, the deepest parts of the ocean, like the Mariana Trench, they found marine debris there. They found it in Antarctica and microplastics in the ice in Antarctica uh, in, in the surface of the ocean, of course. So it really is everywhere and can travel pretty far and is a really pervasive problem. That said, it's a problem totally caused by humans and ultimately is solvable. So I think when you hear about plastics in the ocean and litter and the marine debris issues, it's easy to get depressed because it is kind of overwhelming, but there are solutions. And so if we can kind of keep the focus on that, we can all make a difference. And I'll, I'll talk about some things you can do towards the end of the presentation. Uh, we can all make a difference to this problem. And sometimes it's just really simple behavior changes that can really add up and make a difference for the litter that we have here on land and then also out in the ocean that can be harming marine life. So how does it affect marine life? I have a question there because we're still studying that. We know it affects marine life in a variety of ways and I'm going to talk about that in just a moment, but we don't really understand all the impacts yet. Uh, we don't understand so well yet, for example, if a fish eats uh, a smaller organism that has plastic in it, and then the plastic goes in the fish's stomach. Is that really going to impact the fish? Is it going to impact us if we eat the fish? Because we don't usually eat the stomach when we eat a fish. We're usually eating like the muscle, the flesh. So uh, how far does it go up the food chain? And there's lots of microplastics everywhere, tiny plastics that 
are really pervasive in the environment, um, probably even in the air that we breathe. And it's been documented in like bottled water that we sometimes drink. And if we are uh, kind of absorbing these microplastics all the time, how does that impact us? We really don't have a good understanding of you know, how far reaching and how dangerous some of the impacts are. Another problem with marine life is if an animal dies out in the ocean, a lot of times it'll just sink down to the ocean bottom and you really never know what happened to it. So was it impacted by you know, a plastic bag or something that it ate or was it impacted by something else? Or maybe it died of natural causes. We just never really know because there's a lot of undocumented deaths that happen out in the ocean just because it's far away from us. And it's a symptom of a larger issue, I think. Uh, just the fact that you can go out on pretty much any roadway, park, or out in the ocean or a beach and find litter almost everywhere you go, even in some of the remote places on the earth. There's a larger issue here about the fact that we don't really understand so well our impacts or don't appreciate our overwhelming impacts that we have on this planet and you know the things that we need to do to take care of it. So I think it comes down to a little bit of um, education and awareness and you know, maybe unwillingness on some people's part to value a healthy planet without litter and a lot of uh, consumption versus some of the other values that people have. And there's also issues, especially in other parts of the world where they don't have the infrastructure to deal with the litter that they have. So that is a very real problem in a lot of places where they really just don't have trash facilities. So trash might get dumped in a local river where it ends up out in the ocean. And um, people in a lot of places don't have a lot of control over that at this point. So how much is there? It's obviously really difficult to quantify, especially if you're talking about the whole ocean, how much plastic is out there. But there was a study in 2015 that really tried to delve into this issue, how much plastic is going into the ocean every year and what can we do to help prevent it? And so that was a study by Jenna Jambeck and a huge list of authors uh, that looked at this issue. And if you can see the slides, there's an infographic from this study basically talking about the plastic waste inputs from land into the ocean. And they estimated in 2010, so this study is a few years old now, but they estimated that uh, about 8 million metric tons of plastic waste goes into the ocean every year. And the good thing about that um, not the good thing about that fact, but the uh, interesting thing about the study was that they tried to figure out where all this plastic was coming from. They looked at the amount of plastic production, production, the total plastic waste that was generated, basically what was done with that waste. Was it managed properly and disposed of like in a landfill somewhere where it probably couldn't escape versus what was mismanaged? And they found that, you know, in a lot of countries, like I just talked about there, is a lot of mismanaged waste. Either people don't know where to put it or like in the US, we don't have a uh, very good recycling infrastructure. So for a long time, a lot of our recyclables like plastic bottles and things like that were going to China and other places. So we didn't even have to deal with them. Um, so in the study, they basically found out that if you could invest in some infrastructure for trash management and you know, help these countries improve the solid waste management, then there was probably going to be less plastic going into the ocean. So there was one solution right there. So, but people do always want to know that number of how much plastic is going into the ocean. And it's a lot. Um, it's, I've also heard it estimated as basically if you took five grocery bags full of plastic and dumped them into the ocean and did that along the coastline, all the coastlines of the world. Uh, so it's a lot of trash going in every year. So where does it come from? You know, things as simple as your garbage can. In a lot of places, you know, especially here in New Hampshire, there's a lot of places where we have recycling and we have trash pickup, but they, uh, trash and the recycling isn't always put in a covered bin. And of course, we're right here by the coast, so it's windy all the time and there's storms all the time. So if you put out an open recycling bin and then uh, you put it out the night before the trash comes, then the um, wind can easily blow bottles and cans right out into the street and then they can easily make their way into the ocean. So sometimes even when you try to do the responsible thing, putting your trash in a trash can, like in this uh, picture that you see here, there's a trash can that's kind of half open because the lid wasn't closed all the way, it's overstuffed and that trash could easily blow out. So sometimes stuff gets out into the ocean unintentionally. 
sometimes that is more intentional. This is a, a picture that you can see here, people leaving trash just at the beach, you know, partying for the day and not wanting to bring all their trash to the trash can and just kind of getting up and leaving. Unfortunately, that still happens. Here in New England and a lot of other places around the world, there is fishing gear that washes up on the shore. Uh, the picture here in this image is lobster traps that had been washed up onto a local island. And it's really difficult to clean up some of that fishing gear. Of course, there's a lot of fishing gear that's also lost out in the ocean and is even more difficult to clean up. And then uh, there's things like microplastics. And uh, the picture here in this slide shows a piece of fleece. And there's been a lot more attention on microplastics and my microfibers lately because we're finding they're a source of lots and lots of plastics, but are so tiny that we don't sometimes even see them. So if you take a piece of fleece and uh, if you put that through your washing machine, say it's a fleece blanket or a fleece vest or something like that, if you magnify that fleece, you can see all the fibers that are here, just thousands and thousands of fibers and fleece is made of plastic basically. So uh, basically a petroleum based product, which is a whole other issue. But uh, so, and then uh, if you wash that fleece or wash any fabric really that it's going to be agitated in the washing machine and all these fibers are going to basically shed off and so the picture that you see here are small fibers that are coming off of this uh, fleece and then they end up in your wastewater from your washing machine they don't get trapped by the washing machine just because they're not equipped to handle that which is a whole other solution entirely if we could figure out how to trap some of these fibers that are coming off our clothes when we wash them and uh, then they can end up in the local waterways because they're usually too small to get trapped by the local water treatment plant as well. So this is a whole other source of plastic that is really difficult to prevent. But, you know, again, what happens if a whole bunch of these microfibers ends up out into your local river and gets eaten by the fish that you are later on going to eat? Also, we have plastics that just break down over time. So on our local beaches here in New Hampshire and, and beaches and most other places around the world, you'll have things like little tiny pieces of styrofoam and plastic that are the results of uh, larger plastic items that have been left on the beach or washing around in the ocean that just eventually degrade over time and break into smaller pieces. So what we do a lot of beach cleanups in our organization. And while we don't really, you know, beach cleanups aren't the ultimate solution to the litter problem, right? Because you want to prevent it in the first place. But if you don't pick up that litter on the beach before it washes out into the ocean there, it might turn into thousands of pieces of litter. So if you pick up one plastic bottle on the beach, you do that once rather than having to pick up thousands of pieces of plastic once that plastic bottle degrades into many pieces. So the impacts are pretty wide ranging on marine life. Um, entanglement and ingestion are two of the big problems. So ingestion, basically they swallow uh, plastic either kind of intentionally or on accident. And we know it's at the very start of the food chain, even in the tiny zooplankton, the tiny little animals that are basically at the foundation of the ocean food chain. So uh, we have animals like a copepod, which you can see in the slide here. Uh, this is an animal about the size of a grain of rice. And uh, scientists in the study were documenting that how plastics uh, get ingested by these copepods. So uh, if you see this on YouTube, you can see light green spots. And those are actually pieces of plastic that were in this animal's digestive tract. So this is a tiny animal, but we have a really endangered animal here in New England called the North Atlantic right whale, and they eat about 2,000 pounds of these tiny plankton every day. So, you know, again, we're not really sure what are the impacts if every single plankton it eats happens to have uh, plastic in its digestive system. How is this going to affect this large whale that is consuming all this plankton over time? There, uh, in 2015, there was this kind of viral video that was going around that had a sea turtle with a plastic straw up its nose. And um, so animals can inhale trash on accident. Basically, that's what happened with this endangered sea turtle. Scientists were out um, tagging sea turtles and measuring them, uh, live turtles in the wild, and they picked up this turtle. And apparently they thought there was some sort of parasite in its nasal passage, and they grabbed a pair of pliers and pulled this out. And it turned out to be a four inch long plastic straw. And, you know, through no fault of its own, they're not even really sure how that uh, sea turtle in um, inhaled this straw, but uh, it did have a plastic straw and thankfully the sea turtle survived, it was released, but it really struck a movement on um, 
encouraging more people to skip the straw, basically stop using plastic straws and turn to reusable alternatives like stainless steel straws. Even large whales can be impacted by trash. Uh, the slide I have here is a National Geographic article about how a DVD case killed a whale. Basically a, a whale was stranded, it was a say whale, and uh, they found a shard of plastic in its uh, digestive tract and it turned out to be a piece of a DVD case. And who knows how it got there, it probably got out in the ocean, maybe blew off of a trash truck or a boat or something like that. And this whale swallowed it accidentally, but it, um, basically harm the whale enough and prevented it from feeding. So they can eat these smaller things. Um, you've probably seen plastic bags that uh, impact animals. So sea turtles can eat plastic bags on accident. Uh, large whales like um, beaked whales can eat plastic bags, especially whales that dive down deeply. And um, uh, whales like gray whales, like you guys have off the Pacific coast, they are really uh, deep feeders feeding down on the ocean bottom. And so they can tend to get more plastic inside them than some of the other species that feed a little bit closer to the surface. We had a uh, Atlantic white-sided dolphin, one of our local dolphin species. This was a few years ago that was found on a local beach. And it was uh, when scientists did a necropsy to figure out how it died, they found a balloon inside its digestive tract. So again, you probably either blocked it from feeding or made it think it was full so it didn't eat anymore. And then it ended up dying. The um, slide I have here shows a gray whale that died in Seattle was found in 2010. So back to the gray whales and how they feed near the bottom. Um, this one actually had a pair of sweatpants and a golf ball in its belly, basically, along with a whole bunch of other trash. So they can really eat all this stuff. And they weren't really sure um, in the last uh, news bit I read about this. This is a while ago, and they probably know now, but they didn't really know how much this plastic had contributed to the whale's death. We also have entanglement issues. So animals can swallow the trash on accident, which can you know, either block something or make them feel full, full so they don't uh, feed or they can get entangled in something. Uh, we have seabirds that can get entangled in things like discarded fishing line and whales that get entangled in things. And a lot of times people assume that if a whale is entangled in fishing gear, it was probably lost gear that's called ghost gear that was just kind of hanging out in the ocean, lost out there. But um, that's not necessarily the case. Um, some, a lot of times when whales do get entangled, it's active gear. So gear that was already being fished by a fisherman who just hadn't gone out to check the gear yet. And then the whale swims through it and basically carries it away. So, uh, there's been some discussion over the last few years about how it's not accurate to assume that if you clean up all the lost fishing gear out in the ocean, then that's going to solve the whale entanglement problem because it really won't, unfortunately, because there is still a lot of active fishing gear that's out there and, and both of them can do harm to whales and other marine life. So I've talked a little bit about the couple impacts on entanglement and ingestion. Also, as you might know, there's thousands of chemicals that are used to make plastics. So different chemicals to make them more flexible or more hard or a different color uh, to make them kind of last a long time in the sunlight. So there's lots of chemicals on those plastics. And as they break down out in the ocean, they can leach out into the environment over time. So there can be a lot of chemicals out there from these plastics that um, just get out there. They can also transport invasive species and pathogens around so different things as plastics are floating around out in the ocean, a great current of the ocean, they can um, have invasive species and other things either attached to them or get stuck in them and uh, transport to different parts of the world. So there is a lot of impacts about plastics, a lot to learn about and study as far as these go. And also there's cumulative impacts. So how does marine debris impact whales that are already suffering from different issues? So, you know, there's gray whales being impacted on the West Coast and say animals are already in kind of a precarious, you know, position due to something like we have the North Atlantic right whale in the uh, North Atlantic here that is being impacted by entanglement and vessel strikes and you know what is this extra plastic and chemicals from plastic or plastic in their prey what is that going to do to the whales so we think there's probably some cumulative impacts that we don't know about um, and that are really difficult to study 
So what are the root causes? And I promise I will get into some good news at um, some point in this presentation, but some root causes, basically we're consuming a lot. I was just hearing on the news this morning about, you know, the supply chain issues and, you know, a lot of that, you're having trouble getting products now because we consume so much during the pandemic. People were shut down. They couldn't go anywhere. They took all their vacation money and used it to buy goods, which needed to go from one place to another. So consumption is a big problem. Inconvenience is an issue. You know, we're all super busy all the time. And, you know, we want things that make life easier. So sometimes like if you're a busy mom, you're trying to pack a lunch for three kids to get out the door to go to school, it might be easier for you to just buy those single use potato chip bags and throw them in the lunch bag as opposed to making your own snack and packing in a reusable container. So there's, um, and it's very difficult if you go to a grocery store to find things that aren't packaged or overpackaged in plastic. So we don't have a lot of choice as a consumer, or a lot of times if you do want to go and buy things with less plastic, you have to go to a variety of different stores to get what you need and get things that were made responsibly. And also the manufacturers haven't been made really responsible to uh, package things in an environmentally friendly way. There is all that plastic, you know, plastic waste that about 40% of it is due just to packaging. Packaging is very difficult, first of all, to open a lot of times, but also to recycle or reuse. And there's an issue with infrastructure, as I already mentioned, in the US, we don't have a lot of facilities to process our waste. So we have resorted to sending our waste to other places. And a lot of the solutions that are being proposed are not as good as we'd like them to be. We're always hoping for, I think, this easy magic bullet to just solve this plastic pollution problem, basically wipe all that litter off the earth where we don't have to deal with it and look at it and change our own behavior to prevent it from becoming a problem. But uh, recycling, you might've heard, I think it was last year in the news that only about 9% nine, 9 of things that could be recycled have ever been recycled. So that our recycling rate is really low here in the US especially. There's also been a lot of uh, development of so-called compostable plastics. Like in my slide here, I have a photo of a piece of greenware. So it's a compostable cup. And if you live near a place where there's an industrial composting facility, those work fine. They can be composted there. But I think a lot of people think you can get compostable straws or cups and just throw them in your home composting bin and they don't really break down. And a lot of times when these things, if they're not, composted properly, they can actually contribute more greenhouse gases as they're breaking down than a regular piece of plastic would. So it's great that there's innovation and there are solutions being developed, but uh, I don't think there's an easy way to tackle this problem. So just a little bit about our own marine debris programs at Blue Ocean Society. So we really got our start doing marine debris work because we wanted to protect marine life. We had been studying whales out in the Gulf of Maine for a few years and really wanted to see what we could do to help protect them. And we thought doing beach cleanups would be a great way to not only have our staff involved in doing something tangible to help the marine life, but to have uh, community members and volunteers involved. So we wanna protect marine life, but also learn as much as we can. We are trying to collect data and understand the problem better so that we can contribute to developing solutions, whether those things are more legislative, like laws on you know, plastic bags or something, or balloon releases or you know, solutions to add something to your washer to filter out the microplastics, something like that. But so in order to help solve this problem, we really need to have a better understanding of what the problem is, what type of litter is washing up on our beach, and, you know, is it mostly cigarette butts, is it mostly single-use plastic, is it microplastics, so we're trying to collect as much data we can throughout this process so that we can um, use that and target our efforts, and ultimately, of course, we want to inspire action and behavior change, and so I want everybody to help join in this fight to help have less plastics on this planet and out in the ocean. So our marine debris programs, we've been involved in beach cleanups for a long time. We started an adopt a beach program. So we not only do um, beach cleanups with groups, but we have groups that adopt a beach and then agree to clean it once a month. And every time they go out and do a beach cleanup, they record what they find and then they send us the data and we give them all the supplies and support. 
We also, uh, while we're out whale watching, we record the litter that we see from the whale watches. So we can not only know what's going on out on the beaches, but out on the ocean, is it the same types of litter floating on the ocean as we're seeing on the beach? We can compare those things. And deep. then of course, ultimately, uh, whatever we're disposing of on land can easily end up out in the ocean. And then we also have been doing microplastics research with our local Sea Grant, New Hampshire, trying to study the smaller plastics. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. And as far as our data collection goes uh, for our beach cleanups, we used to use like a paper data card. And if anybody has ever participated in the international coastal cleanup, it's a very similar process. There's a data card that you use to write down everything that you find out on the beach. Uh, when the pandemic started, things started to shut down and we became, we really at that point had no idea how COVID was being transmitted. We transferred our data to a more electronic data collection system. And this is the Marine Debris Tracker app, which was developed by folks down at the University of Georgia. And they also have support from some large partners like National Geographic and Morgan Stanley. And I mentioned this uh, not only to tell you how we collect the data, but also because you, anywhere you are, can use this app, whether you are in New Hampshire or California or India, we've actually had some submissions. You can uh, download this free app if you go to debristracker.org or go on your app store and uh, look for Marine Debris Tracker. And then it will ask you what list you want to use. And in our case, we have our volunteers use the Blue Ocean Society list, which basically is the same list of items that we're looking for that's on our data card. So all you have to, it's free to download. You can create a free account and then wherever you are, track the litter that you find. And then that's really helpful. Then you too can learn about pollution where you are, whether it's on the beach or in the middle of the country, it doesn't matter because all the data gets uploaded to one database that is uh, accessible to anybody. So if you are interested in the pollution problem in different areas, or maybe you're a teacher that has students that might want to do a cleanup and compare their results to other areas, you can go on to debristracker.org and look at uh, what people are finding in other places and, you know, overall what the picture is of marine debris in different areas. So it is pretty fun to use that app and uh, see what you can find. So this is a screenshot. The other thing you can do is uh, log into your account on the web and you can see where you've done cleanups over time kind of geographically and map that out. So this just gives you an idea of our efforts in 2021 so far in 2020. Last year we did much fewer cleanups than in 2019 because there were a lot of beach closures due to COVID for a while. We were also concerned about crowd sizes it wasn't unusual before COVID for us to have a beach cleanup and have 100, 150 volunteers in one small beach. So, uh, so interest was great and we had really high volunteer counts, uh, which was awesome. We were getting a lot of people involved, but then when the pandemic started, uh, we had to obviously scale back on that quite a bit. So, so far this year, we've uh, had volunteers pick up over 56,000 items. You can see a map of the different areas where they've collected litter. Um, all throughout uh, from Boston up into New Hampshire. And then we, uh, at 27,000 collection events. So not 27,000 cleanups, but every time somebody basically bent down, picked up a piece of litter and recorded it, that was 27,000 times. And about a third of that or half of that in 2020. And so we've really tried to transition to this electronic data collection effort, which is easier for some people, not as easy for others if you don't really like uh, using an app out on the beach, that's understandable, but it does save us a lot of time and data entry and analysis because all the information is already online right there for us. And in case you're curious about what we find on our local beaches, uh, I have our 2019 top 10, and this was in our uh, about, we did 268 cleanups uh, in Maine, New Hampshire and Massachusetts, basically a coastline of all of about 35 miles. Now you have a much longer coastlines out there on the West Coast. Uh, we had about 6,000 volunteer hours. So a lot of interest in 2019. And our top items uh, were cigarette butts, plastic pieces, wrappers, and rope. Uh, those were the top four. A lot of what we find on our top 10 list every year is resulting from uh, 
things that have a reusable alternative. So we're finding a lot of single use plastics, basically. We find a ton of plastic bottle caps, a lot of cigarette butts, a lot of wrappers. And what we've been finding a lot of over the last few years are tiny plastic pieces and foam pieces. So those microplastics I've mentioned earlier, uh, the smaller plastic pieces, the result of things breaking down over time. And how does this compare to worldwide? I mentioned the International Coastal Cleanup earlier, that's run by the Ocean Conservancy and has been going on for about 30 years now. And so people from all over the world, wherever you are, can participate in this International Coastal Cleanup. And so in 2020, again, there was much less volunteers than there were the year before just because of COVID and a lot of groups that had traditionally done cleanups couldn't do them last year. But over 200,000 people were involved. They picked up over 5 million pounds of litter and they cleaned up 49,000 miles of coastline. And so their top 10 is pretty similar to what we find locally, a lot of cigarette butts. They did find a lot of uh, plastic beverage bottles, food wrappers, bottle caps, and lots of plastic and foam pieces. So worldwide, uh, the trash issue is pretty similar, no matter where you are, a lot of single use plastic and tiny plastic. And if you're interested in this coastal cleanup data, you can go to coastalcleanup.org. You can find more information about cleanups near you. And also uh, you can download some of the data from the past. I wanted to talk a little bit about litter at sea because while we're out whale watching, we go out on four hour whale watch trips. We go about uh, anywhere from 10 to 20 miles offshore. And while we're out there documenting the whales and other marine life we see, we also write down the litter that we find. Unfortunately, we can't pick it all up just because we'd be picking up litter the entire time instead of watching whales, but we do at least document what we can so that we can get an idea of how much litter is out there and if the items change over the years. So uh, on the slide I have here, and you can also go on our website at blueoceansociety.org and we've mapped out some of the litter uh, totals that we've had over the years. So you can see the uh, litter items that we mapped out from 2020. And you can see that there's a line from Rye, New Hampshire, which is the port of the whale watch boat that we work on out to the areas where we usually see the whales. So it's not a random survey of litter or anything like that. It's basically following the track line of the boat and the litter that we see. But that pretty much means that whenever we're out there whale watching, we're seeing litter and we're documenting it. And it's basically showing up everywhere, including near the whales that we're watching. So in 2020, our top items that we saw out there, uh, a little bit different than what we find on shore, but we had uh, balloons are always the number one or number two items. We do find a ton of balloons. You know, we know if you uh, work in cleanup at all, you know that if people release balloons, they're not going to magically float up to heaven and disappear. They do usually end up out in the ocean or somewhere else on land where they need to be cleaned up later on. So we find balloons, plastic bags is another big one. We also found a lot of wrappers too. So not too surprising that we found, you know, again, single use items, which probably increased uh, during the pandemic, a lot more people using probably disposable bottles and wrappers. We did see a few masks out on the water last year too, as you can probably imagine. We also write down which items were seen near the whales. So eventually we're going to do some more studies looking at the litter, how close it was to the whales and what the whales behavior was so that we can do a little bit more risk assessment to see, you know, is the whale more likely to just kind of pass by something like a balloon or is it likely to be feeding in the area where this litter is and possibly swallow it accidentally. So we had a lot of balloons near whales as well and bags and bottles. Uh, we've also been working on creating maps that show the litter that we see as well as the whale sightings. And for those of you that can see this slide, this is one of our favorite humpback whales, uh, a whale named Pinball that um, we sighted several times over a season and then all the balloons that we saw that same season. So what this basically shows, for those that can't see it, is that the litter and the whales are in the same spot as you could probably guess. So both of them can use all areas out there out in the ocean. As far as microplastics go, we started doing a, this study on these smaller plastics about seven years ago because we were walking behind the other cleanup volunteers and realizing that they were missing a lot of the smaller pieces, pieces of styrofoam and plastic and things like that, just because if your eye isn't really trained to see them, 
uh, you don't necessarily pick them up. You're more likely to notice like a bottle or a can. So we started surveying our local beaches, looking for plastics that were less than five millimeters in diameter. And that's kind of the accepted definition of microplastics. So plastics that are less than five millimeters in size. So again, about the grain of rice or smaller. So these can either be larger plastics that break apart or smaller pieces that um, start out small, things like microbeads that you might've heard have been in beauty products or uh, little plastic resin pellets, which are also called myrtles, which are used basically melted together to create larger plastic products. And so we are uh, doing a study where we're sampling local beaches. We basically sample dry sand and run it through a sieve, kind of like a spaghetti strainer, and just run that sieve through and try to see uh, how much plastic is left over of various sizes. And basically what we're finding is lots and lots of foam. So polystyrene foam that's out there. And we're not really sure where it's coming from. Uh, we're trying to figure that out. It's going to be our next step is to do a lot of data analysis and look at this foam to see if we're not really sure if it's more a consumer product like styrofoam cups or if it's from a styrofoam dock float or sometimes we see construction foam like foam insulation. But uh, foam is the number one item we see versus harder plastics or plastic films. And again, this is another thing that could probably be easily replicated in other areas. So if you're interested in learning more about this project, let me know. So now we get to the good news and we can all help after looking at this issue for 20 years and kind of being immersed in it. I still do believe we can solve this problem, but it does take every single one of us to try to go out and make a difference. Now, I wanted to say something really quickly about the great Pacific garbage patches, because you hear about that all the time in the news and the ocean cleanup project, which is a project that has gotten a lot of funding to try to basically scoop the plastic off the primarily off the surface of the ocean. And as I mentioned earlier, it's great that there's technology and people are thinking and trying to solve this issue, but going out there and cleaning up, even if we could clean magically all the plastic from the entire ocean right now, the problem is the second you did that, there would be more going into the ocean through rivers and streams and from boats and, and things like that. So unfortunately, a, a large scale cleanup is probably not the best solution at this point because you can't really you know, stop the flood unless you turn off the faucet first. And we really need to work on that turning off the faucet bit, getting less plastic out in the ocean in the first place, having less plastic you know, in our daily use uh, in the first place. And, and plastic, it does have its purpose. So, you know, there are a lot of ways that plastic has done a lot for us, you know, in our cars and in medicine and, you know, in a lot of the products we use. A lot of the problem is the disposable plastics that we use and, um, you know, just use for 10 or 20 minutes and then throw out. Or, you know, that a uh, bag of potato chips that's packaged in a plastic bag that might be able to be packaged in some other eco-friendly alternative. So, um, so really reduction and kind of thinking about what we're using and consuming and the products we buy, it's going to take a little bit of thought and behavior change. And if we really want to solve this problem and stop this uh, plastic from going out into the ocean where it's impacting the marine life. There are some encouraging trends. I have some more local examples here, but there have been a lot of uh, plastic bag bans going into place, uh, especially locally here. I'm not as familiar with what's been going on the West Coast, but Maine, for example, Maine is pretty uh, independent and a lot of people don't like to be told what to do. But uh, in the summer, a uh, single use plastic bag ban and a polystyrene foam kind of takeout container ban, those both went into place in Maine, which is really encouraging. And Maine is also making its uh, manufacturers pay for recycling basically now through a law that's called extended producer responsibility. And this is something that could really help in this plastic issue if more uh, states and towns basically turned around to the manufacturers and incentivize them to make uh, uh, packaging that's better. So with this extended producer responsibility law, uh, basically manufacturers have to pay for the recycling of their materials. So there's a longer version of that, but this way it takes the burden from the taxpayer, uh, which is right now paying for, at least locally here, it's the taxpayer they're paying for our trash disposal and our recycling and kind of turns it around and makes the uh, 
manufacturers and the packaging people contribute to that because they're the ones packaging these things in a whole bunch of plastic, oftentimes unnecessarily, and they don't really have to pay for that on the other end unless people ask them to. So this extended producer responsibility trend, uh, it's working really well in Europe where people are recycling more because the packaging is being made so it can be recycled more easily. And there's more uh, financial support for recycling stations. And uh, so building up that infrastructure, again, trying to make it easier for us to take care of our trash responsibly. Maine also enacted, I live in Maine, <laughs> right over the river from where my office is in New Hampshire, but uh, we also enacted a lot on uh, banning uh, release of balloons. So there's a lot of states where that's being talked about as well, just uh, not letting people just do mass balloon releases, which there are still in, in some areas, there's big celebrations where they just let you know thousands of balloons into the air. And of course they can have really bad impacts. So, if you hear about these things coming up in your town or in your state, you can support them as much as possible. And that's one of the ways that we use the data that we collect at our beach cleanups and out on the water. Like when Maine was talking about balloons in the environment, we were using the data showing that balloons are the number one thing that we find offshore. And the interesting thing is a lot of fishermen were complaining about balloons because as they're driving around in their boats trying to pick up you know, lobster traps, they're also coming across a lot of littered uh, balloons that are out there. So they were in favor of this law as well. So that's where when we go out and do beach cleanups and find that there's a problem, then we can use that data to hopefully, you know, provide a push towards solutions. So some tips, if you're looking for ways that you can help, you can, like I mentioned, download the Marine Debris Tracker app, do a cleanup wherever you are, even for two minutes, it's going to make a huge difference. Um, Dispose of your trash responsibly. Obviously, that's a no-brainer for a lot of people. Basically, making sure your trash bin is secured, things are tied up tightly so it's not going to blow anywhere. Uh, try to find alternatives to single-use plastics. If you go to our blog at blueoceansociety.org, we have a volunteer that wrote some great blog posts last year, kind of documenting her journey to uh, use less plastics in her household, and those are really fun to read. She has some great ideas for easy swaps at home to take out some of the uh, single-use disposable items and replace them with reusable items. We have here in New Hampshire have had a number of refill stores to pop up and I hope to see that as a trend across the country with more places opening up where you can refill your products. So say for example you uh, buy shampoo at the grocery store and then you come home your shampoo is gone you need to refill it you can actually bring that shampoo bottle back to your local refill store and have it filled or you can bring a mason jar or whatever you want but uh, so that's working really well locally where we are with beauty products so I can go to our local refill store and get laundry soap and shampoo and uh, you know, whatever, cleaning soap or whatever we want. So uh, hopefully that will continue. And I know in a lot of other countries, that's been a trend and hopefully it will start here. When you're celebrating, use an alternative to balloons, as, especially if you're going to be outdoors, there's a lot of streamers and things like that that are more biodegradable that are less likely to be harmful for wildlife. And again, I just talked about this extended producer responsibility, but again, People, you know, there is bad packaging and there's a lot of uh, litter out there, partly because manufacturers and the oil industry have told people that we're the ones that are responsible for these problems, that it's because we're not recycling that there's litter on the ground. Well, it really also comes from the top. We need to make better products and support solutions to reducing all this plastic out in the environment. So it is difficult, but every little bit helps. And I do truly believe that, and I hope you do too. Uh, so I'm asking you, I'm going to challenge you if you could find a replacement for one plastic item in your house and imagine if everybody listening to this show did. I have a picture of a granola bar here uh, because uh, that was a little bit of a turning point for me. You know, We're an environmental organization, but we have summer interns that help us out every year and the interns help us on the whale watch boats doing education and collecting data. And I was working on the whale watch a lot one summer and you know, say I did 60 or 70 whale watch trips and almost every one at some point I looked back and to see what our interns were doing. And one of them was eating a granola bar and um, with a, you know, a single use plastic wrapper around it. And I was like, gosh, if just, you know, our eight interns every, every summer 
are each doing a hundred whale watch trips and they each have one granola bar every trip. That's like 800 pieces of plastic that could have been prevented if they had used, like made their own granola bars at home and packaged them differently. So, um, so everything does add up, even some of the little things. So even if you, and then I started making granola bars at home and putting them in reusable containers, which is a little bit of work, but it made me feel a little bit better about the plastic situation. But maybe for you, it's not granola bars. Maybe it's just uh, using a shampoo bar instead of a plastic bottle of shampoo. Shampoo bars are becoming more trendy now, or there's even um, different places where you can get, instead of like bottled dishwashing soap, you can get a block of soap. Uh, and then that eliminates that plastic bottle. So I hope you can try to find a reusable replacement for something in your house and hopefully it'll all add up. And again, if you need ideas, I encourage you to visit our website at blueoceansociety.org and check out some of our tips there. Uh, as I mentioned, you can also do a cleanup wherever you are. We organize a lot of group beach cleanups and on our website, we also have a digital cleanup kit. So if you want to do a cleanup or maybe get your group together and do a cleanup and don't know where to start, I encourage you to check that out. Feel free to contact me and I'd be happy to send that to you. Basically, um, overviews, if you want to do a beach cleanup, what are some safety concerns? What are some of the supplies that you'll need and how to use this marine debris tracker app to record what you find so that information becomes useful in the future. And that is really the conclusion of my talk. And I don't know if there's any questions that you all have, but I uh, look forward to hearing from any of you in the future. Again, you can visit our website at blueoceansociety.org. And you can also reach out to me via email at jen, J-E-N, at blueoceansociety.org. And thank you again so much for having me this morning. Thank you, Jen, so much. It's such an interesting, uh, 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 the topics you chose about all of the trash, right, that's in the <laughs> ocean. And I know uh, Scott and Tree are with us, too, and I was, you know, asking them everything that you're talking about uh, are we seeing here as well. And, you know, this whole plastic thing is so tough on uh, all of us, you know, and when we see it, we know that the whales and fish and birds are dying from eating plastic or getting stuck in their stomachs. We know all of this is happening. And what they feed on. And what they feed on. You know, the, the microplankton uh, that showed uh, with the little plastic in it. But, you know, how do we deal with all of this? Uh, the, our micro fibers in our flannel tops that we all love to wear that have all those little tiny things in it. You talked about going along the beach with a sieve. I mean, that, that almost is comical to think of those of us who live near beaches to think going inch by inch with a sieve to get the plastic out, mm. but what it takes, I guess. How many, how many people to help you do that? Well, that is, um, we're just getting samples right now. So we're not cleaning the whole beach, which yeah, <laughs> even for our small beaches, it would be impossible, but we are uh, setting down meter size quadrats and getting a sample of sand and seeing what plastics come out of that. So that doesn't take very long, but we do have a number of citizen science volunteers that are helping us with that. Yep. You, you talked a lot about what doesn't belong on the beach, but if in a, an ideal world, what does belong on the beach? Um, <laughs> I mean, well, you know, there's a lot of natural things that wash up, things like seaweed and, um, you know, stuff that, you know, natural stuff that comes in from the ocean. We have a lot of seaweed here that a lot of people are like, oh, we should get that off because I want to watch, <laughs> I want to walk on the beach and not walk on seaweed, but there's actually a lot of critters that live in there. So, and, you know, it's fine for people to use the beach and walk on the beach if you pick up after yourself. You know, actually I have here in our studio, I have this little plastic orange pterodactyl <laughs> it's just on top of our our studio console but i found that at the beach and i brought it home you know i mean all these little little plastic toys that you find yeah. on all kinds of things right. well i thank you for this excellent presentation a lot for us to think about and this will be on youtube quite a while it is on youtube now and it uh, is viewable at any time too on uh, if you have your phone, if you want to connect it to Bluetooth to your car, you can listen to the previous days or days. You can cast it up to your TV and watch it on TV. Lots of different ways to listen in. Uh, you know, it will, and just one other follow-up, because uh, we do have, I have another yeah, little, have little bit time. more time here. Um, 
a lot of it, as we were talking offline, as we were listening, and we were talking about creating those habits, like, you know, a lot of times you go to the grocery store and they might give you a usable, reusable plastic bag. Mm -hmm. The idea is to continue to re use it. Or if those of us who might be using cloth bags uh, or mesh bags as we go into the store and we get our vegetables and then we wash them, we wash our bags. Yes, but it's about do. training ourselves, right? right? Mm -hmm. do, you, do you teach people uh, that also? How do they train themselves to get used to recycling and reusing? That's a good idea. I mean, yeah, I think a lot of it is the habit. And it, the encouraging thing is locally here in our grocery store, you know, um, 25 years ago, everybody used plastic bags. And then all of a sudden these signs started appearing on the, on the door of the grocery store. Did you remember your plastic bags? You know, so I think, or remember your reusable bags and then you could walk up to the store, see the sign. Oh yeah, I forgot those and run back out to your car. And, you know, it is worth it and takes only a few seconds. So I think, you know, like you said, a habit and maybe, you know, pick one thing. You don't need to do it all. If we all just did one thing or two things, it would definitely make a difference. I even found that you have, uh, you can order biodegradable trash bags and mm -hmm. other kind of bags to help preserve your food so that when you toss them, they actually biodegrade. Do they? So, uh, that's a good, good point. And uh, it also, though, of course, leads me to the question, how long does it take for them to degrade? Well, that's a good question. And then the other thing too, is all of our laundry, you know, it comes in those big plastic mm -hmm. tubs. And uh, so I started using boxed powder again. Mm -hmm. I was so used to using the liquid, but I went back to using box. So that's another way. And then of course, those uh, lots of different kinds of mesh bags that you can get for the vegetables and bags to carry your gro groceries that, um, right, that you can wash. Yeah, I was intrigued as Leanne is talking and you, you mentioned about going to laundry soaps that are now uh, big hunks of soap. How do you wash your clothes with? I mean, do you chisel them off? Are they breakable? I mean, I, oh, I don't I use think I was talking about a, a dish dish soap and you have like a, a, a like a, soap? a hard bristled brush that you use like a, a dish brush and then you oh, kind okay. of scrape the soap off. And then. and then, you know, if you're using hair supplies too for shampoo and conditioner, you can get those like in, in bar soap for your hair and i'm not sure what you can get for conditioner I, do you know anything about that i think i've seen maybe one barred conditioner but that's not hard i think you probably there's probably um conditioning shampoo so all in one kind of i thing. love all of these new things that we can do i mean as when you travel you know you love getting those little plastic bottles of things but then you end up with all of those right. so anyway i, I just uh, want to appreciate all the work that you and your organization are doing in talking specifically about all of this waste and how we need to change our lives as we have moved into this world that we're in now leanne Thank you very much, Jen, from the Blue Ocean Society. I'm Leanne Lindsay. This is Peggy Berry Hill and George Callis with us here in the studio. And you are listening, if you are just tuning in, to the third annual Ocean Life Symposium Day 2. And we are going to introduce the next speaker in just a moment. I want to let you know where you can find the schedule. You can go to our website kgua.org and click on schedule. It's an interactive schedule. Also in the left-hand corner, if you click listen, not live, our Air Pocket app, you can save to any mobile or digital device. And that too has an interactive schedule. Abs pretty, pretty cool. Absolutely. And uh, if you have any questions or right. comments about any for any of our speakers, you can write to us at all one word, Ocean Life Symposium at gmail.com. Once again, Ocean Life Symposium at gmail.com. Yes, and now, George, who is our next guest? Well, that was a pretty uh, great act, uh, tough to follow. She was a great <laughs> leadoff hitter, but on deck is Bill Keener of the Marine Mammal Center. Many of us in the Bay Area are quite familiar with the work that they do. Bill's going to be speaking about Tales of Urban Whales, San Francisco Bay's Cetacean Restoration. Bill's a research biologist with the Marine Mammal Center, and he's worked with marine mammals since the 1970s. In 2010, he organized a team of scientists to study the whales, dolphins, and porpoises of the San Francisco Bay and the whole Northern California coast. Over the last 10 years, he initiated the first Bay Area 
photo ID catalogs for humpback whales and bottlenose dolphins. Bill, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate being here. And uh, I've got a lot to say about the research that we've been doing. Uh, the Marine Mammal Center uh, and our team has been doing up on uh, the San Francisco Bay and the northern coast into Sonoma and Mendocino even. And so I've got a lot to, to share and show you. So let's get the slideshow started. And um, so that's me. And also if you, uh, for people who can are on YouTube, you're welcome to uh, write me anytime, uh, keenerby at tmmc.org. That's the Marine Mammal Center.org. And uh, we'll get going here. So uh, in brief, there's four basic cetacean species. Cetacean is the family of whales, dolphins, and porpoises. And so we've got the little harbor porpoise uh, here um, shown, and then bottlenose dolphins we're going to talk about in particular because they're the ones that are really uh, have changed their range recently and are moving into the Sonoma and even Mendocino area. And then we've got gray whales, uh, a lot of people from, very familiar with those along our coast, and humpback whales, which have a new story going on in San Francisco Bay. So we'll cover all of that. All right, first, right, let's. we're gonna go from smallest to largest. So we'll start with the uh, harbor porpoises. And uh, these, are, these are small guys. I mean, when you see them out in the ocean, sentiments, sometimes you can see them from the beach. They're pretty small, a little tr uh, triangular, dark dorsal fin. And uh, they're only about 100 to 150 pounds, for, you know, five or six feet long. And a lot of people ask, what's the difference between a porpoise and a dolphin? I get that confused. Well, no wonder years ago, uh, when I started uh, in the 1970s uh, uh, studying cetaceans, uh, scientists use those words interchangeably, but now they don't. They talk about porpoises as the small, uh, cool water coastal animals. There's about half a dozen species and the larger dolphins that are the more oceanic and tropical or temperate water um, species. And really the, it's just because there was two different roots to the words. Porpoise comes from the Latin porcus piscus, meaning pig fish. And the delphin comes from the Greek word delphinus or delphus, which is uh, the dolphin. So the story in San Francisco Bay is that um, even though we had looked for them, uh, we had not seen harbor porpoises in San Francisco Bay for decades. Um, now they were along the outer coast. Uh, they were never really particularly hunted here, um, but the, all of a sudden around 2008, they started coming into San Francisco Bay. And I think it's really an untold environmental success story. Um, a lot of people don't realize that there's really a cleaner bay. There were issues with the bay that I'm gonna go through, um, but the, uh, many of those have been resolved, at least partly, um, and leading to a more favorable environment for the porpoises, meaning there's more fish, because it's all about the food for these animals. If there's food, they're going to be attracted, and if you clean it, they will come. And there's also things going on in the bigger ocean uh, system uh, with ocean, with climate change and, and what's going on in the ocean that's also affecting this. So this is what uh, harbor porpoise looks like in San Francisco Bay and uh, sailboats go by now and they often don't even, um, you know, Hello, notice Bill. that there's porpoises there. Can you, can you see me? Uh, we don't see your screen. We need you to share screen. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't realize that. Uh, uh, let's see here. Okay. I thought that was already done. Uh, well, I do. I have it set to allow you to do that. Okay, so let's see. If you did, did that work? Screen. Did that work? Uh, no, click on the green share screen. I did that. Uh, I did that. And, and then it says, share says, the share at the bottom. says desktop. Yes, now click on the blue share in the bottom. Yeah, then it says open system preferences to allow for this. Let's see. Uh, there we go. Mm. You'll get there. Uh, let's see. Well, which uh, which system are you on, Bill? Uh, well, I've got a Macintosh, so I'm just trying to figure out what would be allowing allowing this. Um, well, let's see. Uh, I'm going to bring in Paul Mundy. He's an expert with our Mac systems, and see if he can't step you through this. All right. Yep. Paul. 
work with Bill here. Okay, okay Bill, if you see the, the green button says share screen. Yeah, I've already hit, hit that. Okay. And then it says desktop. Yep. And and I hit that, but the problem is it says. Oh, you don't oops. need to, you don't need to select desktop. No. You just click on the bottom right share. I did that. And it says open system preferences, security and privacy to grant access. So I, I'm going to go to security and privacy, and then I'm going to try to uh, grant access to do this. Okay. Um, well, I don't see how to do that. Uh, let's see. It says here, there is a thing saying, allow the apps to record the contents of your screen. Screen recording, uh, full disk access, files and folders. Go to desktop, um, and you can find your program. Just click on that, and then open slideshow. I did that. I've been doing that. That's what I was doing for a while. I didn't realize you weren't seeing me. Uh, let's see. What else can we do here? So, uh, so it's so you should be seeing what I'm seeing, yeah. and the, it says that the the issue is that. Um, Okay. All right. So I think we got it now. No, he should, he should be able to do it and we okay. should all be able to Let's go. See, up. you Zoomius will. Okay. Um, Your audience, yeah. uh, we're, we're going to get this hair. fixed. You know, it's just something <clears throat> we've all experienced over the pandemic this last year and working remotely, but we'll get there. Uh, I'm, Okay, camera, microphone is on Zoom. Yeah. Okay, so. Can you think of anything else, Paul? Uh, all I can it's think just, of is- It's this, this security thing. Yeah, like, a, hmm. like yeah. I was saying, Paul, I had a new system, so I think it just wasn't um, you and I were practicing yesterday, it came up fine, and I was able to see it, so. Yeah, but we didn't share screen yesterday. Oh, the, oh we didn't, okay. Okay, so um, this looks like it might work now. I don't, uh, let's see. I'm gonna try it again. I'm gonna try to share screen again. Yes. There we go. There we go. All there right, we go. Bill. Fantastic. All right, so. Uh, we just had to get over that one step, but we're now gonna continue on with the Ocean Life Symposium and Bill Keener. And Bill, if right. you the slideshow and just open slide. Uh, you know, no, 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 yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'll, I'll play it from the start. Very good. Very good. Uh, all right, Bill. Okay, we're good? We're, we're good, thank we're you. Okay, I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> Little technical difficulty, but we'll uh, jump right back into it. And so uh, I just want to show you briefly, uh, for those of you uh, watching, um, the four cetaceans of San Francisco Bay, the harbor porpoise, bottlenose dolphin, the gray whale, and the humpback whale. And we're going to talk about all of them. And uh, this is the harbor porpoise, this little... Uh, 100, 150 pound animal that lives uh, off our coast uh, all the way uh, north. And I talked br briefly about the difference between porpoises and dolphins. Um, and then the fact that harbor porpoises are now in San Francisco Bay. So here's a picture of a harbor porpoise near the Golden Gate Bridge that I took a, several years ago. And um, we'll talk about, start with a little bit of history. So if you go back uh, and think about, well, harbor porpoises have come back to the bay. How did I know they had left in the first place? One of the things we do is we look at archeology span and we look at the, the past and what the Native Americans have done. And one of the things they did in the Bay Area is they had a huge uh, mound um, that was uh, from the materials that they had in their culture in Emeryville. And if you go down the freeway on I-80, there's actually Shell Mound Street. Well, that was a massive shell mound um, that was absolutely taken down and is now sort of under the Ikea area. And, but in, fortunately, in, at least in the, the 20s when this was being um, demolished to make room for industrial facilities, um, a scientist from uh, UC Berkeley went in and cataloged uh, many of the bones of animals that they found there. And they found um, lots of porpoise bones and a few uh, bottlenose dolphin bones as well. So we know porpoises 
were there in the bay uh, reaching Emeryville um, probably for hundreds of years. The shell mound existed from about 700 uh, BC to around 1300 AD. So that's 2000 years of history of porpoises uh, in the bay. And then things changed, of course, with European settlement. Um, the, uh, there was a whole host of changes in the bay, including particularly in the 20th century where they started building Treasure Island, which is a totally artificial island that changed the currents in the bay. Uh, the Bay Bridge was built, and around the same time, the Golden Gate Bridge was built, and they were blasting um, foundations out. This is exactly the sort of thing that would make a harbor porpoises want to leave an area. They're very sensitive to acoustics, underwater noise, noise pollution, and they did apparently um, start driving them out. Now, we do know that some porpoises existed in the bay in the late 30s. Here is a, a picture that was drawn in the field notes of a UC Berkeley biology professor. And he was out seeing these in San Francisco Bay or from Point Richmond, uh, where he would go fishing regularly. So he was seeing these on a regular, uh, sort of regular basis when he'd go out fishing at least, till about um, 1939. And then of course, World War II hit. And that changed even more things in the Bay, not just the military ship traffic, with all its noise, but really we think the key thing was that there was a submarine net. And here um, there's a map showing this submarine net that was from San Francisco to uh, Sausalito. It's a massive thing. Here's a picture of it on the left uh, of an aerial photo in 1942. And it was all the way across and it was made of uh, uh, four by four mesh to keep submarines out. On top of that, they would lay these um, 16 inch rings to keep torpedoes out. Nothing could go through that net. Whales couldn't go through it and neither could even porpoises or dolphins. So there was really all the big animals uh, couldn't migrate into and out of the bay like they used to starting uh, from World War II. And that uh, was through the entire history of the war all the way up to um, the end of it in August 1945, when the fishermen hated this thing, of course. And so it was pulled out the day after the war ended. Um, but by then it was kind of too late. There was um, a lot of pollution, a lot of sh ship traffic, uh, and the uh, uh, porpoises had abandoned San Francisco Bay. So it's years later after restoration efforts, Clean Water Act, all these things, helped to uh, restore the bay and um, lead to more fish in the bay that attracted the porpoises in and they're here today. They're, there's now 365 days a year. And if you go out on the Golden Gate Bridge at high tide, like I often do, you're looking, uh, this is a, a picture showing as if there was no water in the bay, showing you this trench underneath the Golden Gate Bridge where the porpoises go at high tide. And this is a picture of me on the Golden Gate Bridge trying to uh, take photos of porpoises. And we wrote a scientific paper about this, the return of porpoises to San Francisco Bay, um, and talking about what we can learn. The first thing we tried to do was try to identify individual porpoises, which had never been done. They're small, they're kind of shy, and uh, they don't show a lot at the surface. But once in a while, you can find ones with a scar on them. Like here's a one with a little uh, fork-shaped scar. And this was seen five years apart. And so we know that this animal seen early on as a uh, single animal showed up with a little calf later on. So we know this is a female. And we've seen unusual porpoises. Here's a white one, a uh, nearly albino uh, porpoise uh, with a regularly pigmented porpoise uh, next to it. And that's one that we could see for a long ways away. And so we, we could uh, tell when it was coming and that was kind of unusual. Um, we saw behavior that hadn't been seen in harbor porpoises before. Um, like uh, they would go behind ships and ride the wake along. Here's a mother and a calf riding a wake um, behind a ship. Now they're not uh, as bold and adventurous as bottlenose dolphins. They don't go up to the front and bow ride uh, ships, but they will come behind it. And then we saw a lot of interesting stuff going on with foraging, their feeding, and uh, what kinds of uh, fish they're feeding and how they feed on fish, which had not been documented before. But here's a, a photo um, of a porpoise and he's chasing this fish here on the left. 
But of course, there's this pelican that's also eyeing the same fish. And believe me, half the time, the seabirds will see the fish and get to it right before the porpoise can. Um, here's a little video I want to play for you, showing you um, just what it looks like from the Golden Gate Bridge. There's the porpoise on its side with a gull very keenly interested in what's going on in there. And, and that gull makes a dash for a fish that was driven to the surface by the porpoise, but the gull got it first. So that's kind of how, how sort of interesting and, and intense the porpoise life is uh, underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. And there's another reason it's intense too, and that has to do with their reproductive strategy. So one of the things we wanted to know was, well, are the porpoises using San Francisco Bay for anything other than feeding? And the answer is yes, uh, for their, uh, not only their mating, their sex life, but also they're raising and uh, calves in San Francisco Bay. It may be a sheltered environment and they're um, using that to bring their calves in. Now, these calves are born uh, usually around June and um, they stay with their moms till the next spring and then they separate. So they're together about nine or 10 months and her gestation period is about 10 and a half months. So actually these adult porpoises, many of them, if they give birth every year, the adults, females are pregnant and lactating their entire adult lives, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and they only live till about say 10 years or 11 or 12 years old. So really they don't have a lot of time to have these uh, once a year calves, but they, they seem to, to be thriving along our coast. Now here's um, a photo that I took, we were quite surprised at. I was on the Golden Gate Bridge and I saw a porpoise leap out of the water all the way out. And we had not really seen that before. So I took this picture, blew it up into my computer and we were looking at this thing, trying to figure out really what, what is going on here. And this is its uh, penis, which is um, fully out of this male uh, porpoise. And we were going, what is going on here? And we realized this was in a mating attempt or mating uh, that we were seeing and no one had ever seen this before anywhere. And so we started uh, studying that over the course of years, we got to see this uh, more and more often until after about 10 years of this work, we saw this thing, uh, uh, this event, this uh, attempt at mating, like this is another picture of it where this is the female down here and the male is flying out of the water above her. Um, we saw it many times, 144 times for, is what we published in our paper about this. And here's a video to show you what it looks like in real life. And it's one second long, that's it. It's just sort of a crazy, and here's it slowed down. You can see the male flies out of the water, back into the water, and, but the female, meanwhile, has been turned around. So it's quite an amazing uh, kind of, uh, mating habit that they have that seems to be very unique. And so one of the things we started thinking about was why are we lucky enough to see it only under the Golden Gate Bridge? Because we've looked for it elsewhere and never saw it. And we think it has to do with the fact that when porpoises are out in the ocean, they're spread out everywhere. And when porpoises are in the bay feeding, they're spread out everywhere too. But it's only they come together in this narrow one mile wide section, the strait underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. Males in fact know that females will pass by there. And we've even seen them wait in that area for females to, to pass by and they will try to mate with them sequentially. So uh, we sort of, humorously dubbed the Golden Gate uh, Strait now the funnel of love, at least for harbor porpoises. And, um, but the point is, it's like being, um, think of a rural area where uh, people are spread out in farmhouses everywhere, but Saturday night they come to the barn dance, that's where all the social action is. Well, the barn dance is happening underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. And so uh, we were just lucky enough to, to, to discover that. The other uh, animal that we've uh, seen this really interesting change in their range is the bottlenose dolphin. Now these are bigger than harbor porpoises, about twice as big, and uh, they got a bigger, taller, swept back dorsal fin. Uh, and we'll take a look a little bit uh, at, at some of those shapes in a second. But one of the other key things is that they live much longer than harbor porpoises. They live about 40, 50, even maybe 60 years. So we can do long-term studies on these guys. 
this, the type of study you can't do with a shorter lived harbor porpoise. So this is what we're seeing, uh, started seeing around 2010, basically in San Francisco Bay. There'd been a sighting earlier uh, in 2001, uh, but we didn't really get any pictures till around 2007. And um, so this is the kind of thing we, we see. Here's the um, Richmond San Rafael Bridge in the background and uh, Bonlow's Dolphins in front of uh, Red Rock Island. Here's uh, Half Moon Bay. So you get a sense of the, that taller dorsal fin that's not squat and triangular like the porpoise. And here's a comparison photo so that if you're ever out in a boat uh, or from shore and you look at the, these dorsal fins, you can see this taller uh, dorsal fin for the uh, bottlenose dolphin. And look at this beautiful picture. This is uh, by Stan Angel at Salmon Creek in Sonoma because uh, the interesting thing, of course, is that these dolphins had not been seen in uh, Sonoma or even Northern California uh, before around the year 2000. So now this is something you can, the surfers at least get to see. <laughs> and then we've also had some interesting individual animals come in like a solitary uh, dolphin uh, that was nicknamed Kaimi by a local a canoe club in Alameda because it was off Alameda for three years just hanging out in a very small area until it uh, met up with some of its um, uh, compatriots and left the bay uh, and, and was seen outside the bay. So it's made it out, out of the bay, but why it stayed for three years in the bay, we're not really sure. The thing we really try to do when we see these dolphins along our coast is to take photos for photo ID because their uh, adult uh, dorsal fin has nicks and notches that's a unique silhouette for every adult animal. So we've got 120 different dolphins now cataloged in the last 11 years along our coast. And some of these go way back because we know by comparing it with researchers further south that for instance, this animal Bliss on the right was first seen in San Diego in 1982. So she's an old lady now, but still active along uh, our coastline. And this is this little chart here just shows you um, how many dolphins have been added to our catalog over the years. So there was a few photos taken in 2007, eight to be precise, eight animals. And then we started, you know, seeing more and more and more over the years. And then around um, 2016 and 17, it plateaued at 92 animals. But now it's been going up again. And it could be that we had a little bit of a, uh, a lag there because we didn't get out as much during the pandemic. Uh, we couldn't get out on the boats for a while there. We were shut down from our research, but now we're active again and we're up to 120 and it's increasing. So I expect to see even more uh, bottlenose dolphins um, in our area, but here's their history. Until 1983, there were no coastal bottlenose dolphins in Northern California at all. They were only down in the Santa Barbara Point Conception area south to San Diego. And so um, there was a huge El Nino in 1983 and that warm water led them up the coast to Monterey Bay. So they made it to Monterey Bay by 83. And then when the water cooled, they didn't go all go back. They stayed there, they've got fairly large brains. They're able to navigate, find food in a new area. They're exploratory, pioneering, and that's what you get. You get bottlenose dolphins in a new area and they may not go back to their old haunts. They may stay in a new area and that's what happened. And then they slowly crept up the coast to San Francisco and all the way now we believe their sort of uh, Northern range is Sea Ranch area um, in uh, near Gualala. And then um, they have been seen occasionally even further north than that. And I'll tell you about that in a second. So one of the things we're doing is we're trying to map out where uh, these guys have been seen, these bottlenose dolphins, Sea Ranch here. The Russian River Mouth is another favorite place they like to go to feed, Bodega Bay, uh, and then Marin and, and, um, in the, and San Francisco Bay, of course. But we are also looking here on the left side of this map I'm showing, um, there's uh, many different dolphin researchers in Southern California, and we're sharing information so we can figure out which dolphins have migrated north into uh, Northern California. 
Now there's only about 650 coastal dolphins in all of the states. So to have 120 here after 10 years, that's very significant. About 20% are all of a sudden shifted north. <clears throat> the, these maps here that I'm showing you just show you some colors um, moving north of these dolphins, but I'm gonna break it down a little more, uh, uh, zoom in here for you. So in the eighties, this is Southern California, that's Los Angeles here. And really the dolphins were down there and into Santa Barbara. By the 90s, they were pretty much the same, except there was more in Santa Barbara. By the 2000s, they were well-established in Monterey Bay and a few had made it to San Francisco Bay. But look what happens starting around 2010. Monterey Bay, San Francisco Bay, all the way up into Sonoma Coast. And that's the situation we see today. So they really have moved and we think it's, because of uh, climate change. There's been um, certainly the big uh, El Ninos and the blob, that big uh, warm water um, uh, ocean uh, current and, and system that was off our coast in 2015 and 16 in particular. So here's an example of Bliss. That was the old lady I mentioned that was born in 82. So here she is, 1982 in San Diego on this map. She makes it by 99 up into Los Angeles. By 2006, she's in Monterey. 2012, she's in San Francisco. And then once she, during this sort of warm water episode, she went all the way up to uh, in Mendocino County here to Sioux Meg State Park, which used to be called um, Patrick's Point State Park, but now it's got the, the Yurok name of Sioux Meg. And, um, but she came back. So she's back, uh, back in the Bay Area. So did not stay that far north. Now here's a different dolphin, Smooch. Uh, now these names were mostly given by the researchers further south than us, but the dolphin does get a number. Here's the Marine Mammal Center number for this uh, individual as well as the, the nickname. And this dolphin's got a very complicated history where it's bouncing back and forth using its whole range of California now. Uh, it started um, in 1984 in San Diego, moved to Santa Barbara, and then it went down uh, up to Monterey, but then down to Ensenada, Mexico, and then all the way up in 2012 to Bodega Bay. So, and this animal's, you know, was seen uh, later in San Francisco Bay. So that's a, an animal that's using its whole range. Then we've got, um, uh, Ernestina, this is an animal that is pretty typical for many of the uh, animals here, which stays between uh, Monterey Bay and San Francisco and um, the Marin Coast. And so what this animal is doing is just treating Monterey Bay, San Francisco as one area. Because when you think about it, Monterey Bay is not that far for a dolphin to travel. It just takes two days, say, to get down there. So really, it's kind of the same area for them, we think. Now, here's a real interesting one uh, for people up in uh, Mendocino, because we were looking at, at an animal named Vibe. Um, and I saw Vibe underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. I photographed Vibe under the Golden Gate Bridge in February 2016. Now, this is when the water was still a little bit warmer off our coast after this blob event. And, um, but then Vibe was seen uh, two months later in Mendocino. Fortunately, Ron LaValle was able to take photos at Little River and um, send them to us. And we were able to identify, quite surprisingly, Vibe and another uh, uh, fellow traveler, Willow, another bottlenose dolphin, but they did not continue north. They didn't, they didn't even stay in Mendocino. They came back. And uh, the next month, Willow was in Bodega Bay. And the month after that, Willow was all the way back down uh, towards the um, Golden Gate Strait, along with Vibe. So they returned. And then the most unusual animal we've got is Miss, and she's actually traveled with a few others, but we've got this good ID photo of her. She's got a very unique uh, notch in her dorsal fin, makes her easy to identify. And she had a sort of a typical early, uh, uh, you know, uh, history where she starts in San Diego in 1985, moves to Monterey, 
moves to San Francisco, and then she bounced around a little bit in um, uh, Mendocino to Sonoma, but then all of a sudden she makes a, a, a rocketing trip north <laughs> all the way to Puget Sound, which is absolutely unheard of uh, for bottlenose dolphins. So she holds the, the long distance record for coastal bottlenose dolphin travel. It's an extra, you know, thousand miles of travel. So We've got pictures of her in Orange County here. Here's one at Rodeo Beach that, that I took. And this is the same animal you can see by the dorsal uh, fin silhouette in Puget Sound. And this is her with, instead of the San Diego, you know, uh, beaches in the background, you can see this is the dark green forests of uh, Washington State. So we've broken out these dolphins into about half of them tend to stay in the, our northern area, meaning Monterey Bay to San Francisco, Marin, Sonoma. Um, and then half are range-wide travelers. They'll go back and forth all the way using the whole coastline. And this is very different than uh, bottlenose dolphins on the east coast of the United States, where they'll stay in a small area their entire lives. And the difference is, is uh, just their habitat and where they find food. It may take our bottlenose dolphins in their little narrow coastal one mile wide strip up and down the coast, they may have to travel a lot farther to find um, this patchy food um, that, with the fish they wanna eat. We are finding that they are um, breeding and having calves in San Francisco Bay in the Bay Area. And the way you can tell that is you can look at a picture like this of a calf dolphin and look at this vertical pale bars. These are known as fetal folds. And fetal folds are created when the uh, baby, the fetus is inside the mother before it's born and it's kind of crunched up. So when it's born and stretches out, it has stretch marks. So these stretch marks will fade after a couple of months. And so we know this is a very young, a neonate uh, animal. And we've seen this several times in our area. So it's not just that dolphins are coming up to feed. They have brought their, uh, their basically their social structure, their society with them. And they are breeding, uh, mating, uh, calving, raising calves uh, in our area. Another thing that happened um, that we weren't expecting was um, when you get animals that are moving into a new area, they're going to meet other animals. And here the bottlenose dolphin has met with uh, harbor porpoises, which are smaller. And sometimes the bottlenose dolphins are aggressive and can even kill a bottlenose dolphin. This is something that wasn't seen in Southern California, because in Southern California, there are no harbor porpoises. But look, if uh, on this map, I'm showing you the range of the many thousands, there's 28,000 harbor porpoises estimated in uh, California north of Point Conception, uh, all the way up. So this is the bottlenose dolphins as they came up, they're running into the harbor porpoise uh, uh, populations. And what happens is that you'll see on a beach, the Marine Mammal Center has had, had every summer uh, for the last several years, we'll do the necropsy, that is the autopsy of an animal, um, where there'll be rake marks. So all these marks on this dolphin, uh, sorry, harbor porpoise, are uh, if you just measure these uh, marks out, they'll match the intertooth distance of a bottlenose dolphin that was about one centimeter. So, and you'll also find of course, broken bones and stuff. So it turns out that it's only because we can identify the dolphins doing this often, it's only young males doing this activity. The females don't participate in this. So that's something we're looking at. It doesn't seem to be affecting the porpoise population. They have many thousand, this is happening in very small numbers, but it's still something that again, you just can't tell what's gonna ultimately happen when things change and a population changes because of say, uh, climate which allows them to travel into new areas. And another thing that we've seen, uh, which is not happening in Southern California, is that the dolphins are now feeding on salmon. And which is of course a very critical, um, you know, uh, sustainable um, food source for, for us along the, the North Coast and has been since, uh, you know, for thousands of years. And, um, but the, we've seen uh, definite signs that the dolphins will, uh, can tackle these bigger fish, which the harbor porpoise could not possibly um, feed on. It's just too big for them. 
So that's something we'll also have to keep our eye on. Let's talk about gray whales because a lot of people are familiar with gray whales along the coast. And um, they you know, have been along our coast for thousands of years migrating from their feeding grounds in Alaska to their breeding grounds in the lagoons of uh, Baja in uh, Mexico and passing by our coast. So they're uh, fairly long lived animals too. Um, and one of the new things that we've seen just in the last few years is that during a migration, uh, during their um, spring, winter to spring uh, migration back north to Alaska, many are pausing in San Francisco Bay and apparently to feed. This is a picture of an uh, a gray whale on its side. That's its right flipper stuck up into the air as it's rolled onto its left side. And it's trying to feed to suck up the mud that's right here just offshore. This is Kirby Cove looking onto the Golden Gate Bridge here at the left. And so this animal is trying to uh, bring in mud, which it strains through its baleen plates and leaves little um, shrimp or worms or any other little bits of protein it can get. And that's what it feeds on. Now, there's not a lot of food in the San Francisco Bay compared to the feeding grounds in Alaska, but we, uh, speculate that some of these animals are so hungry, they will just try anything for a snack. And that's what's going on. So around 2019, we started seeing a lot more of these um, migratory stopovers in the Bay. And that was at the same time that the US government um, declared what's called an unusual mortality event, which you may have heard of, where gray whales were dying in unusually large numbers along our coast. And um, we, we saw that. Here's a picture in the bay uh, with the Presidio in the background of a gray whale. And we tried to do some photo identifications of gray whales. It's hard to do. They don't have a dorsal fin. Um, and it's, it's hard to, sometimes they don't lift their flukes very often to get a, a picture of the pattern underneath the fluke. But sometimes we can uh, just tell them apart by the splotchy, natural pigmentation pattern on their sides. And we've been able to determine that some of these gray whales have been in the bay for as long as six weeks, which is extremely unusual. In normal years before 2018, um, we would see a gray whale maybe approach the bay. Was, I spent a lot of time on the Golden Gate Bridge, as I've mentioned, along with my colleagues. And we'll see a, a whale come in and spend a few hours and leave and continue on its migratory path north. Um, but this time, the last few years, they've been staying for uh, days and weeks at a time. And the Marine Mammal Center has been uh, really um, right on the uh, front line of trying to um, uh, deal with the, the deaths of gray whales in our bay. Um, here is two animals that died a, a couple of years ago at the same time, and they were um, towed out to Angel Island where the necropsy was done of these animals. And there was about a, a dozen that year. And what they found was that uh, many of them were suffering from malnutrition, just like we thought. That's why we saw some of that feeding behavior. And um, worse than that is that some of the ones that were uh, suffering from malnutrition had a thin blubber layer were also killed by a ship strike. That is, they were hit by a ship, possibly while they were in the bay, and in a weakened state, maybe they weren't very reactive to the boats around them because they were so uh, kind of um, get maybe a little dopey or a little um, um, moribund or they start floating around in a, certain, in a way that they wouldn't normally, they be, might be more active. So uh, this is a photo I took uh, of what happens out in the uh, eastern part of San Francisco Bay where you know high speed ferries come by, ships are going by. And a, a gray whale has a very low profile in the water as you can see here. So it doesn't show a lot. It's just hard um, to see, see them uh, always surfacing. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about uh, ship strikes because we're gonna talk about the, this last whale that we've got, um, large whale that uses um, San Francisco Bay and that's the humpback whale. So the humpback whales are even larger than um, gray whales. They also are, are long lived and um, they were also quite a surprise um, to find them in San Francisco Bay because again, I'd, I'd been looking for years um, for whales to be in the bay and we would see the occasional gray whale. 
But um, there was also a history of uh, humpback whales in our area. Now, they had been uh, hunted off our coast. And one of the things you should be aware of is that the last whaling station in the United States was inside San Francisco Bay. It was in Richmond. There was a shore station. So what they would do is they'd send out boats through the Golden Gate out into the ocean. They would harpoon uh, humpbacks and other species of whales, um, sperm whales and others. And then they would drag them back, tow, tow them through the gate all the way back uh, into uh, Richmond. And then they would um, cut them up and boil them down and uh, have oil and they'd also have meat. And what was the meat used for? Well, it was for pet food. So that was going on um, all the way until the humpbacks were uh, hunted till the 60s, 66, but the other species were hunted all the way till 1971 when um, the uh, Marine Mammal Protection Act uh, went into place along, uh, alongside the um, Endangered Species Act. And that shut down whaling in our country for good. Then in 2016, after not seeing uh, whales in the bay, except for the Humphrey the whale, which was a famous whale in 1985 and came back in 90, that was lost and went all the way up to Rio Vista, way up the Sacramento River. Now <laughs> that whale made it out, but really we only saw a Delta and Dawn in 2007. Um, that was another uh, lost mother and calf. But th those are lost whales that will all of a sudden in 2016, we saw lots of whales coming into San Francisco Bay. I've seen as many as uh, 15 uh, to 20 uh, humpback whales in San Francisco Bay at the same time, and they were not lost. Um, so this is the kind of thing we started seeing where there'd be humpback whales just out in the middle of uh, all the passenger uh, boats and the sailboats uh, in San Francisco Bay. And from the Golden Gate Bridge, it was an amazing sight to be able to see. Here's a rainbow spout coming off a humpback whale uh, in the bay. Here's, and we would get out in boats and do research. We have a federal permit to get out and approach these animals so that we can try to identify them, see what they're uh, doing, try to figure out their behavior and why they're here. And here's a video of whales. This is from the Golden Gate Bridge that I took uh, a few years ago. And now one or two, but here's three whales that are right under the Golden Gate Bridge. Beautiful. So then we started putting together a catalog uh, of photo identifications. Now, remember with bottlenose dolphins, you looked at the dorsal fin and the unique silhouette. Well, for humpback whales, the gold standard of ID is to look underneath their tail fluke so that you have to get the underside of the fluke and they all the adults will have a unique black and white pattern. Some will be more white, some will be more black, but there's always a unique pattern um, to these whales. And we've got 77 different humpback whales that have been in San Francisco Bay. So there's been more, we weren't able to capture on film every single uh, whale, but most of them, I would say, maybe there's about a hundred that have probably used the bay is, is my guess, but 77 we know about. And when you can uh, get that kind of research, when you can do the photo identification, you can trade your photos again with researchers in other parts of the world and track animals across the Pacific. So here is a picture um, taken just uh, inside the Golden Gate Bridge. This is on the Marin side of the Golden Gate Bridge. And here's a mother on the left with her calf on the right. And so we have pictures of her that match her in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. And that is the breeding ground of uh, these humpbacks, the Central America to Mexico is the, the main breeding ground. So here on uh, late February, she was seen with that calf, the same calf, that's when it was born. Um, and she made the 1550 mile journey uh, estimated all the way to San Francisco by June. So a few months later, she's in San Francisco feeding there uh, with her calf. And uh, we've been able to identify more than half of the uh, whales that have been using San Francisco Bay have been identified in Mexico or Central America. So that's, that's pretty exciting. 
And we're working up uh, a paper on that about uh, this new use of humpback whales in San Francisco Bay and their feeding. And um, one of the things I just want to note to you is if you guys out in the in the audience there ever get a picture of a humpback whale, you can just send it in to happywhale.com and happy whale will uh, try to match that whale for you and figure out if it's a known whale. And whenever that whale is ever seen again throughout its life, you'll get an email saying, hey, this whale was seen here. It's kind of a cool way to um, bring a little bit of um, social media citizen science uh, to bear on the difficult issue of tracking these whales across thousands of miles. So what were they doing in the bay? So this is what we were seeing. This is a picture I took from the Golden Gate Bridge where uh, we saw these whales coming up together uh, simultaneously with their throat enlarged with tons of water. That's how they feed in the water column. They, they're not like the gray whales that feed on the bottom muck. These guys want to feed on fish that, or krill that are up in the, in the water column. Now there's no krill in San Francisco Bay, but there is fish and that's what they were after. So in fact, if you take a look at this, there are fish flying out of the water here trying to escape the the jaws of death here from this whale. And these fish, these little fish are anchovy. And there were large shoals of anchovy frequently in San Francisco Bay now, and that's what they were targeting. And you can see this, this picture here is just uh, inside the Golden Gate, the Golden Gate Bridge is uh, to the right. And this is like the warming hut at Chrissy Field in the background here on this photo. Now, wh why now? Why were we seeing them all of a sudden in San Francisco Bay when we hadn't seen them in years before? And part of the answer has to do with the fact that we've stopped killing them <laughs> and their numbers have rebounded tremendously. When I started looking at uh, humpback whales offshore in the 70s, there was probably around 2,000 uh, humpback whales in the North Pacific. Now there's 20,000 or more. So they've gone up 10 times because their population is recovering. So that's really yeah. another amazing success story that we all can like see for ourselves. And if you look a little bit more carefully at what's going on with these different populations of whales, you hear about the, the humpback whales coming into Hawaii uh, for the winter. Well, that's a very separate population. They tend to go feed in, in uh, Alaska and go back to Hawaii. But our uh, animals, the humpback whales that we see off California into Oregon, um, tend to breed in Mexico or Central America. And here on this uh, map from uh, NOAA, the federal government, um, they're labeled as either threatened, the Mexico population, or uh, endangered, the Central America population. There's only about maybe 400 of those. The Hawaiian population, by comparison, is about 10,000. So it's, it's their much larger population in Hawaii. However, the real reason that the Mexico population is still considered threatened is because as they come out, they, they're not open ocean travelers like the Hawaiian ones. They are coastal. And so as they come up the coast, they're running into ships and they're running into fishing fleets and fishing nets. And they can get entangled at a lot greater rate than uh, other humpback populations. So that's why we're still very careful uh, and they're still on the endangered species list. Now, one of the, the interesting things we're doing is that we're collaborating with Cascadia Research Collective, and that's a group that's been doing humpback studies the longest in the North Pacific. And one of the things they also do is um, do some tagging. So we invited them down to do some tagging in um, San Francisco Bay. And this, I'm going to show you a little video here in a second, but this is James Fallbush. And he's got a long carbon fiber pole, and he's going to attach by suction cups a little um, package of scientific instruments onto the back of this humpback whale. And this is what it looks like. And that's the way you do it. And the humpback goes down. And a couple of hours later, um, this uh, little instrument package will fall off. Now, that day they were out there. I was on the Golden Gate Bridge. I took this picture of one of the uh, three humpbacks that they 
um, uh, tag that day uh, going underneath the bridge. It was a little bit foggy. That's why it looks a little dim there. Uh, but this package, you can see here, I, I blew it up. It's got four suction cups and it's got a bunch of instruments that can uh, tell the, uh, the depth that it's at, temperature of the water. But more than that, even the uh, what's called kinematics, that's the movement of the animal, how it's moving in the water is speeding up, slowing down, accelerating. And that's very important as you'll see in a second. So when you uh, get the results after this tag falls off after a couple of hours, uh, then you can get the information from it. Uh, you put it into your computer. So here's the whale, this in blue, that was tagged uh, inside the bay and it went underneath the Golden Gate Bridge, that's where I took the picture and went out, joined this other one that was uh, milling about in this area for a couple of hours, and then it continued. And then this orange one stayed in the same area for about two hours the whole time. So what was it doing? So when you get the, the dive profile that you can get from these instruments, here's what you see. So here's the depth on the left to about 30 meters. So it's about hundred feet is about this level here. So they were going down to about hundred feet um, and that's where they were feeding. How do we know they were feeding? Because the little accelerometer in that scientific package can tell you when a feeding lunge is being, uh, it was happening. Uh, now that's happening underwater. We couldn't see it. I showed you pictures before of the whales coming to the surface and bursting through the surface with their throat full. Well, they're doing that underwater. It's just that we don't, didn't know that until we get the tag on them. And you can see that they have several different feeding events underwater. But the other interesting thing you can tell from this is as you, they come up to breathe at the surface, um, how much time do they spend in shallow water? Well, you can calculate this out and in this little chart, you, you, it shows that a considerable amount of their time, about um, three quarters, 75% of the time is spent in 15 meters or less. And about 30, 100% uh, of their time is, um, well, not quite 100%, but a lot of their time, um, this say 80% is, on a lot of these dives is um, at 10 meters or less. Well, 10 meters or less, they're in danger of being hit by a ship. That's a ship's, the big ships in San Francisco Bay can reach down you know, many meters um, in, into the water where their hull um, can strike a whale even underwater so we wouldn't even see it. And so here's a picture of just, I mean, whales are large, right? We know that whales are big, but ships are way bigger than that. Here's a, a picture inside San Francisco Bay uh, taken by um, a citizen scientist uh, uh, who's been a very valuable, uh, Joey Muleman. And he's got this picture with this treasure island in the background and this um, container ship coming in and this whale just moving aside in time uh, to avoid being struck. And here's a photo I took. I was standing on the hill above the Golden Gate Bridge looking across to San Francisco. This is the VA hospital in San Francisco across there. And this um, puff of steam is the whale spout, a humpback whale. And I saw this container ship actually move aside to miss this whale, like that it is, it swung to the left side towards uh, the camera um, to uh, go around this. Now, if there had been a ship moving the other way through this narrow uh, Golden Gate Strait, it wouldn't have had room to maneuver and it would not have been able to, um, to change course. So when you think about what's the largest man-made object in San Francisco, I mean, the Golden Gate Bridge is pretty big, 750 feet tall, but then you get the building Salesforce is new, so it's a thousand feet, but really the largest man-made object are the ships coming in. And I've seen this in particular one, this is the, uh, it's a French ship called the Ben Franklin. Uh, and here is a humpback whale compared to this uh, particular ship that uh, uses San Francisco Bay. And that whale is very small next to it. So this is a real um, conservation concern for us is how to protect the large whales in San Francisco Bay.
And we see, of course, small boats can pose uh, a much less of a danger, but still sometimes it gets crowded in the bay. And here's a picture taken from the Golden Gate Bridge again, where sailboats are almost running out. It did not hit this uh, humpback whale here, but it was close. And then taking our data, all the, the years of work of looking, going out in boats and looking from shore and taking all these photos, what do we come up with? What have we learned? Well, we learned where the humpback whales go, where they use the bay, where they're looking for anchovy. And that's the blue dots, all the blue dots on this map. Here's the Golden Gate Bridge right under here in this dense area. Uh, all the blue dots are humpback whales. Whereas all these gold color orange dots are the gray whales and they're much farther into the bay. So they're not feeding on anchovy. They're going in and sometimes we've seen them go down, turn on their sides and uh, muddy the waters um, inside the bay, but they're basically resting, moving back and forth for days at a time. Whereas the humpback whales are coming in on the tides and will often leave six hours or later uh, on, on a tide. There'll be far less humpback whales in the bay at low tide than there is at high tide. So we can get a picture of the whales using the bay. We do get a few whales south of the um, Bay Bridge in the South Bay, but not very frequently. So one of the things we're exploring, we're thinking about is as these whales come in, what is the single uh, fastest, easiest thing we can do to try to protect them? That's to slow the ships down. So out in the ocean at the Greater Fairlawns National Marine Sanctuary, which stretches all the way north to Point Arena, um, there's already a program in place to um, protect endangered blue and humpback whales. And that is to have the skippers of these ships voluntarily slow their ships down to 10 knots or less. They may be going 15 or 20 out in the ocean, but as they approach and get into the marine sanctuary waters, they've been asked to slow to 10 knots. And that does two things. First, it gives time for the whale to get out of the way, it can hear the, the ship coming. And secondly, it gives the, the skipper or the bar pilot that gets on to bring the boat into the bay time to see if there's a spout in front of it and um, slow down even further or move aside if possible. So that's the one thing that we're really working on is trying to um, slow the ships down. So there's two issues still out here. First, um, there's what's called an exclusion zone. And on this map, it includes all of San Francisco and into the Bay. So this means it, the uh, area was excluded from the National Marine Sanctuary. So the rules or the voluntary participation um, that's been requested of these skippers does not apply in the exclusion zone or in the bay. So one of the things we're doing is working with what's called the Harbor Safety Committee um, of uh, the Port of San Francisco, the, the San Francisco Bay Area and the Coast Guard to try to come up with some voluntary rules for the bay. So in other words, as these ships come in, they may be going fast out in the ocean. They slow to say 10 knots, uh, participating in, the, in this um, speed reduction program um, that the uh, sanctuary has, but then they might speed up again as they get into the exclusion zone. So we're saying, no, let's just have a 10 knot uh, speed uh, uh, limit as best you can hold that all the way through the bay um, so that the uh, animals, the, the humpback whales and the gray whales are not uh, as much at risk by these ships. Bill so that's a thing we're working on. One minute to wrap us up. Thank so uh, that's it um, for my talk. And uh, I wanted to thank a lot of people uh, that we work with here, um, that we collaborate with and, and the Marine Mammal Center and our team really appreciates all the work um, done by, especially the uh, Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary. Um, and I'll leave you uh, with at least my, again, my um, uh, email address, because if you can't get an answer uh, to a question, um, you know, right now, you can always write me later on or write through the Ocean Symposium and we'll get you an answer. Thank you so much, Bill. That was a fascinating presentation. And, you know, especially for those of us, I grew up in Alameda 
and now I'm living up here. So you're talking about my life of coastlines and beaches here. And we've lived here too for about 40 years as well. So this is the whole territory we're all used to. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And a lot of the uh, information you gave, uh, uh, Paul Mundy and I were trying to remember uh, we don't remember seeing as many dolphins when we were young and growing up in Alameda. And so it was interesting watching that. The other thing that uh, I just may make a quick, I uh, have a quick question for, is you were talking about all the ships and now with all of, with COVID, all the ships are waiting offshore, particularly in Southern California, there's dozens of ships out there. How is that affecting the migration? So um, it's never good to have lots of ships uh, close to shore. It's not really happening off San Francisco. I will have to say this is a sort of a Southern California phenomenon. And um, right now, fortunately, um, there's no gray whales or very few gray whales in our area. There's always a few that stick around like um, Scott Mercer, you know, looks at, at and Tree looks at, at uh, humpback whale, uh, sorry, gray whales off Point Arena. And there's some at a few at the Fairlands, but really there's not a lot. And the humpback whales um, do come along the area. So that is a concern. Um, the more ships and whales get together, that's never a good combination. Well, we're going to have to leave that as your last word. Thank you again so much for this presentation. And we're going to have to wrap it up now. Thank you, uh, Bill. We learned so much from you. It is 11 o'clock. It's KGOA in Wallala, 88.3 FM. You are listening to the Ocean Life Symposium live. We've got our next speaker coming up. Yes, we do. And this is, again, KGUA in Wallala. You can find the interactive schedule on our website, kgua.org, and on our app, Air Pocket app, that you can get also on the website. You can carry it with you and have the schedule all the time. And now, George, who do we have up next? Well, we just heard Bill Keener get on base with Tales of the Urban <laughs> Whales, but now batting cleanup, Michael Stocker with the Ocean Conservation Research. He'll be talking about East and West Coast offshore wind. Michael's the founder, uh, founding director of Ocean Conservation Research, a scientific research and policy organization which is developed, uh, which is focused on understanding the impacts of human-generated noise pollution. Sorry, ocean noise pollution. <laughs> His book, uh, published in 2013, entitled "Here Where We Are: Sound Ecology and Sense of Place." reveals how humans and other animals use sound to interact with their environment. Michael, welcome to the show. Wow, thanks for that introduction and uh, it's lovely hearing, uh, hearing Bill today. He's really always really fascinating to listen to. And thank you guys for hosting this. This is really a wonderful thing. As, you know, we uh, have the ocean right next to us all the time here, but we don't necessarily pay as much attention to it as we should. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and hopefully I'll be a little more successful initially share sound here and I'm going to share that screen here and here we go. You see that here? I'm going to play the slideshow. Yes. So, uh, yeah, we'll find it from the current slide. There we go. Um, yeah, so I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about offshore wind energy uh, and the pivot away from fossil fuel, from offshore oil. A lot of the work that we were doing uh, in the past uh, administration had to do with, uh, with oil. Uh, I should say that one of our big concerns is noise pollution. We were told by Jacques Cousteau erroneously that the ocean was a monde de silence, is a silent world. Um, it is anything but because we have uh, a situation where animals at nighttime, they, they don't all just kind of go to bed like we do. And um, when you get down a few hundred feet, it's also very dark. So we have amazing sound perceptual adaptations uh, and not just perceptual, but also phonations of these animals that they use to get around, to establish the relationship with their surroundings, to navigate, uh, to uh, communicate with their conspecifics and to avoid predation. So there's all these different uh, adaptations and I'm gonna run through a few of these here uh, just to give you an idea. For example, if you stick your head underwater in most uh, uh, temperate areas of the ocean, you're gonna hear what sounds like champagne or 
this uh, sand scraping around or whatever. And what it is is these uh, snapping shrimp. And they have this amazing large claw that they shut and they shut it so fast that it creates this cavitation bubble. And the impulse of that cavitation bubble is strong enough for it to stun its prey. So the little invertebrates are swimming in front of it, uh, essentially get stunned, and then they can kind of stack on them. And the sound of that is this. So can you hear that on the ra in Radio Land? I'm presuming no answer is a yes. Um, so one of the things about this is so Michael, ubiquitous. We were letting you speak, but yes, we do. Okay, hear. I just want to make sure you can hear it. So good, thank you. Um, so one of the things that's uh, been proposed is a guy John Potter who did some work on this uh, using this background sound, much like sunlight illuminates our surroundings and the sunlight bouncing off of it will give us an idea of what's around us. He was proposing that the sound, that ubiquitous sound of the snapping was acoustical daylight is what he called it. And when it is emitted initially, it's randomized, it's stochastic noise, but when it hits a boundary, coral or rock or sand or another animal, it bounces back as a coherent phase front, a sound front. And that animals may be perceiving that as a way of looking around. And he was able to use some very elaborate computer programming to resolve this. Um, he was do, working for the, um, the Malaysian Navy on this and they funded that. It was an interesting pro process, but you know, it took a lot of computing power. He did this in 2001, 2002, fantastic work. Um, so another critter here that uh, that is we're going to play back is this mantis shrimp. This is a pretty large one, and I think people probably know the mantis shrimp from the fact that they have these amazing eyes that have twelve different cone wavelengths on it. So they sense light in a very spectacular detail that's really outside of our ability to be able to even conceive of. But they also uh, have these courting styles that they, they burrow together. The male and the female meet each other and they'll burrow together and they will have relationships as long as 20 years. But when they're feeling frisky, they will court each other. And this is a two mana shrimp that are purring to each other. People also maybe know the mantis shrimp from their, uh, they have these front arms that strike out really fast and they can shatter the glass in the aquarium. They're kind of hard to keep because of that if they can't hang creep. Um, so we're going to have a, the, a, the sound of a, of a healthy reef. This is, you're going to hear fish chortling. You're going to hear this ubiquitous snapping shrimp in the background. You're going to hear some grinding and grunting. Uh, these are all pretty much fish and invertebrate sounds. That's a really healthy reef. You don't hear it, uh, uh, you don't hear any holes in it. So this is a critter that we have uh, here. In fact, in Richardson Bay about 30 years ago, there was an alarming aggregation of these. Uh, people thought, as you'll hear, they thought it might be uh, extraterrestrials or maybe the Navy was doing something untoward or what have you. But these are, uh, Two midshipmen courting a female, two males courting a female. And this is a long cut, so I'm gonna cut it short so we can, oops. Uh, they're about six inches long, but they're really loud and they were keeping people awake. And I, I don't, haven't spoken with any anchor outs uh, in the past few years whether they're uh, 
but that was a remarkable aggregation. And then this is a Bardiella, silver perch, and they also have their particular, they, they have these breeding aggregations where they get together and they get excited and they make all this noise and then they're gamete dispersal animals. So they don't, uh, they don't pair up per se, that the males will get to the level of excitement and they'll release their sperms and the females will have the same exciting release of their eggs and it kind of mixes together in the water and that's how they um, use, use the the ocean as their collective womb. That goes on for hours and uh, it's really noisy. So now this is probably stuff that we're more familiar with the sounds of these various animals, but I've got some remarkable versions of it. The humpback whale, of course, was the first uh, animal that had a gold album when Roger Payne recorded the songs of the humpback whale back in 1972, it became so popular. And, and I believe it had a, a role in people realizing that these animals were beautiful and that uh, it was 72 was right when they were questioning the Marine Mammal Protection Act was starting to come into play. And I think that this, uh, the beautiful sounds of the humpback whale was really the theme song of that. And as people probably know who are listening to this, uh, the humpback whale uh, breeding clades get together and they, all the males will sing the same song. They will have the same appoggiaturas and the same codas and the same groans. And, and it's an interesting thought as to, you know, usually when you talk about animals using sounds as a breeding inducement, there is a component of it called uh, breeding fitness announcement. And usually animals will dis, uh, differentiate themselves or distinguish themselves because they're more colorful or they're more vigorous or they're more, um, it's more something or other. And that all the males of one breeding clade will, will sing the same song is, it's a marvelous thing to think about um, and why they do it. It's, uh, it's one of those beautiful mysteries. Uh, we have minky whales. This is a, a remarkable sound. Um, that was recorded by Jason Adamka. In a, this is actually an Atlantic version, not a Pacific version, but it's a, they call this the Star Wars sound. Now it's hard when you're recording animals in the ocean, you really, to, to make sure that that's what's making the sound, you've got to see the animal while it's being recorded so you can verify that that's where the sound's coming from. The Mickey whale also has this interesting, and in fact, all the workles, the Mickeys, the blue whales, the sea whales, the fin whales, and the breeze whales, are, they're all in the same kind of cousins to each other of different sizes, but they have this pulsing that they do. And if you listen to this in a, in a shortened time zone, if you speed the tape up, they sound like crickets. And so my thought was that these animals are chorusing like crickets, that they are synchronizing with each other. And that is how they're establishing the relationship to their larger community. I am still trying to get a couple of hydrophones out with these animals around to verify that I have recordings with only one hydrophone. And again, as I was mentioning before, you really need to see the animal and um, the sound at the same time. We know that these animals do pulse, but I have these pulses that look like they're synchronous and I had to do some mathematical modeling and it looks like with one hydrophone, the distance between them, the attenuation, some of the other math that I worked into it, looks like they are, there were two individual animals that were synchronizing together. Okay, now we have the, uh, this is probably one of the more acoustically complex animals on the planet here. Uh, they were called the carpenter fish by the old whalers, and you can hear why. Sounds like a bunch of journeymen on Monday morning. Um, but they make a lot of other complex sounds. This is, this is a community sound when they hang out together, like they are literally doing, it's kind of napping like this. So make these social sounds. Uh, together. And then, of course, we have the orcas. And these are probably one of the more intelligent animals on the planet. Uh, maybe 
toe to toe with beluga whales, but far above humans. <laughs> These guys managed to, to uh, cooperate with each other. But this is a, a basically social sounds and. <laughs> What we're not hearing in this recording are the biosonar signals, which are, um, well, we, we would hear, hear them as clicks, but they're bursts of very high frequency sound, which they use to see their surroundings or environment. But these are social sounds. We're just hanging out and enjoying each other's company, I presume. Um, okay, so uh, establishing that the ocean is an acoustic environment, uh, one of the things that uh, basically I've been working on since 1992 is to try to determine what impact the human generated sounds have on the ocean. And I did not string any of these in because I was talking about uh, wind farms most. Well, I have some wind farm sounds, but uh, the shipping noises, the, the ocean is 50 times louder now than it was just 50 years ago due to shipping alone. And we know that the shipping stresses these animals out because in 2002, 2001, September 11th, when they had the Twin Towers disaster, they shut down shipping in the ocean for over a week. And there was a woman, Susan Parks, who was, has a lab up in the Bay of Fundy, and she's been recording these animals and recording their habitat for a long time. And simultaneous to that, there was a woman, Rose, uh, Rosalind Rowland, who was measuring their, their stress levels as, a, as a, uh, evidenced by cortisol in their feces. And so she was basically doing a longitudinal study on this. And all of a sudden, the ocean got a lot quieter and those cortisol levels dropped down dramatically. And then when the shipping started up again, the cortisol levels rose. So this was the North Atlantic right whale. There are Unfortunately, the latest count is only 366, 336 of these. We lost 30 of them just last year. So um, these are critically endangered animals. And uh, the stress is probably one of the things that, that accounts for that because the Southern Atlantic right whales, which are off of uh, Brazil and Argentina to South America, they're thriving, there are thousands of them. And the difference between the Northern and the Southern in terms of habitat is a southern uh, habitat does not have very much shipping noise. And the northern is all this commerce between Europe and the United States There's fishing and there's all these ships that are bringing goods back and forth. And that is maybe one of the things that might be, be uh, at cause for the uh, North Atlantic right whale not springing back because their, their breeding fitness is being compromised by, by stress. Okay. So as I uh, mentioned early on, the last administration was being driven by the oil men. And so they came out with this map of leasing areas for offshore oil. And you can see the dates 2021 20, through 23, 24, where they're just gonna open up the entire coast. Now, we have had a moratorium on offshore leases in the, North, uh, in the Atlantic and Pacific um, for years now. And uh, so we were about to lose that. And myself and a, a bunch of colleagues from Oceana and Southern Environmental Law Center and Surfrider, South Carolina, were basically stomping on grass fires for four years. And we managed to arrest those leases. So they did not issue any leases. But why were we concerned about that? Aside from just the, the threat of oil spills, my engagement had to do with the noise. And in 2007, there was a change in policy where they decided that they wanted to open up the Atlantic, at least to check what's there. And so we acquiesced that, okay, look, because the taxpayers are the stewards of these, we should know what's, what's actually offshore. And we 
conceded to have one seismic survey, which is essentially all detail in, in the next slide, but it's very noisy. And we thought, okay, one, we at least need to know what's there. Well, what they had proposed was to open it up to commercialize the seismic surveys. So they wanted to have six different companies had 11 different surveys that they were gonna do overlapping each other. So it would have turned the whole Atlantic seaboard into a war zone for a couple of years. That was because they wanted to privatize the data so that they could each sell whatever particular angle they have to the particular oil companies who are interested in these leases. And uh, they, went, they went crazy on the thing. We managed to put the brakes on it but this is some of the things that they do. So they, this explosion hits down and it goes down into the substrate and bounces up to the streamer that all have all these hydrophones on it and they can determine what is below the sea bottom. And this is a pretty small one here, uh, but you see there's these eight streamers here and, uh, or I should say eight, eight air guns and then the streamers that they're pulling, which they can kind of get a 3D idea of what's down below the surface. PGS, uh, one of the companies that does these uh, that, that does these surveys, was so confident that they were going to be able to plunder the Atlantic seaboard that they built this $2 billion towing vessel um, so that they could um, do the work. And they're, they're doing some work with it, but not as much as they were hoping. This is what it looks like at the surface, and uh, the, the sound, this, if I can sync it up, you'll get the idea here. Perfect sync. I never did that. I usually get it on one side of the other, but that's pretty good. Um, as you see, you get this big bubble that, that kicks out and then it contracts. And I believe that that contraction is as much of a problem as the explosion. There uh, was a paper out by Rob McCauley. Uh, he did the research in 2012, 2013, that looked at the damage to zooplankton. It seems that these, uh, these explosions really kill zooplankton. And we tried to do a parallel study up in uh, the Cook Inlet last uh, in the fall of 2019. We had a, a bunch of um, hydrophone arrays that were placed around the seismic survey they were doing up there. But we also did uh, zooplankton trolls and tried to figure out if we could look at damaged zooplankton. Uh, the problem that we had that Rob didn't have is that the Cook Inlet has a 23 foot tidal swing. So the, the tidal mixing was really too radical to be able to reliably choose before and after. We went in front of the boat, we dropped our uh, bongo nets down into the water and we pulled them up and then we had to get out of the way. And then we went behind the boat and, and dropped the bongo nets down again, uh, 30, uh, 20 and 50 meters and pulled up what we were hoping was going to be water that had been trolled through by these seismic air guns. And it turned out that, uh, as I said, the water mixing was too, um, too extreme to be able to make that kind of correlation. So we're working on now um, to try to get uh, a lab uh, situation where we actually have a pool and we can shoot at high speed the explosions and the impact on the zooplankton that are adjacent to it. What I'm thinking is happening is that the contraction of that bubble is creating a negative barotrauma. So animals are used to pressure. In fact, zooplankton migrate up and down the water column, sometimes to hundreds and hundreds of feet. And so they're used to that pressure on their bodies and they're built for that, the shells or whatever particular outside armature that they're, that their um, protein is thrown around is used to that, but no animal is used to that negative bear trauma where all of a sudden it goes below, you know, kind of below the pressure of your surroundings. And it's kind of like a vacuum cleaner. You know, I think it's the, the one thing that distinguishes humans over pretty much all other animals is humans are the only animals not afraid of vacuum cleaners. But the, uh, if you see cats around vacuum cleaners, they get the creeps because uh, it's a negative bar, uh, barometric or it's kind of a negative pressure zone. And it's something they just do not, they're not wired for. 
And so I think that this is the, the thing that may be causing it. So hopefully we can get funding for this project and, uh, and we'll come up with a definitive answer because that would be uh, a big uh, feather in our cap in terms of putting the kibosh on, on seismic surveys. Um, another problem we have for, for ocean noise is, um, oh, I think, I think I can move this. Yes, I can move it. Good. Uh, is the offshore, uh, deep water offshore work that when they do a, a oil extraction, they go down really deep and they'll go down, you know, 10 kilometers uh, and they'll be in, you know, uh, oh, 1,000, 1,500 meter water. So it's like 5,000 to 10,000 feet water. Um, and they don't want to pull all the stuff that they're getting out of the earth up with them because uh, a lot of it's useless. You know, you have a lot of slurry, you have brine, you have other stuff. So they have these seafloor processing equipment that separates the stuff they want from the stuff they don't want and then re-injects the stuff that they don't want back into the, the deposit uh, and then brings the stuff that they do want up to the surface where they then offload it and, uh, and take it to shore and do the secondary processing on it. But these, you know, we have huge pieces of equipment that are operating under gargantuan pressure. And it's not a, it's not a uh, formula for quiet. So you have these industrial zones. It may sound like this. And that would be around the clock. I mean, it does not stop. So animals in this area, which, you know, might be um, a little more sensitive to their surroundings are being bombarded with this noise. It masks their biologically significant signals and it's, it's continuous. Um, we've been trying to get some metric, metrics on this as well. Uh, unfortunately, it's very difficult to do research around these. They usually have a five mile setback. So. Uh, I haven't quite figured out yet how to how to get the sounds that we want to get off of the stuff to verify how loud it actually is. But anyways, um, that that was one of our concerns with offshore oil. Okay, we got we got through that last administration. The oil guys had to let go of the tiller, and this current administration is basically trying to to go green or go blue, as we say in the ocean business, um, and using. Uh, wind power and solar power to drive our energy future. Um, so you'll see that these are the same kind of leasing areas we were talking about with the oil and gas guys um, here along the Eastern Seaboard and the Gulf of Mexico and along the Pacific coast here. And to dig into it with a little more detail, um, this is Atlantic and there are 30 different areas that they're working on. And some of them are more, uh, advanced and developed in others, but um, they're uh, really starting to do the scanning work. We're doing a lot, we spent the last, we're still in the middle of it, in fact, doing uh, evaluations of environmental impact statements, and environmental uh, assessments to try to come up with responsible ways of doing this. It's not gonna compromise the habitat for, uh, it is, well, we're changing, we're changing the whole coastal profile here. This is where the North Atlantic right whale is going to have to figure its way through this um, maze of our forests of uh, wind farms. But the East Coast has a slightly different situation than we have on the West Coast because it's shallow water. And so they have these kind of four different types of bases that they use. This is basically a driven pile, a single driven pole, pole that they uh, then uh, fasten the mast onto. This is a tripod pile that's stabilized. Uh, this is what they call a jacket. And the, the, again, they're still driving piles. And then this is a gravity base where they don't really dr drive piles. They just, it's heavy weight and that holds it together. Um, the pile driving is, is problematic because you can imagine having these giant pieces of steel having to be driven down, you know, hundred feet into the, into the mud. Um, it makes sounds. Now they have these mitigation techniques. Those are bubble curtains that they put around that decouple the noise to some extent from the surrounding. But um, this is would be a small uh, kind of coastal pile driving. Oops.
it doesn't stop at four though. Typically when they do that, it would just go on for, well, depends on how big the uh, installation is with the uh, wind farms they would be hearing this for a couple of years around the clock driving piles. There are other ways of, of mitigating, but um, we are encouraging the use of gravity bases because they're uh, not so noisy. Uh, they don't have to drive piles. Here's a larger a larger one. This is kind of more or less the size here. Um, So instead of the air guns, we have another bangy thing. And, uh, you know, they can isolate it to some degree, but this is something, this is like some, it's like, you know, your neighbor who has a Harley shop and he likes to idle his Harleys all day Sunday. Um, this is what we're doing to the ocean. So this is, uh, brings us to some other components of this. Um, do I have the operator? Oh, there it is. I'm trying to find my button uh, as as they are spinning you will hear uh this grinding sound or this kind of uh screaming sound which is the transmission because they have these gearboxes in them and then you hear the pulsing of the propellers going by the mast and then you also hear this uh, constant wind sound and this is transferred transmitted down into the water column by way of the mast. So, uh, of course, the underwater sound component of that is troubling. Uh, we're seeing some problems with uh, uh, invertebrates on up to um, marine mammals. The fish are having problems with these sounds. Um, but one of the things that concerns me, and we really haven't done a lot of research on it, is above the waterline, that pulsing that you hear is the blade was it, when it passes the mast, and it creates again, a barometric variation that uh, may be troubling for migrating birds because birds essentially, migrating birds, they sense the pressure of their barometric pressure around them. They, uh, and this was first noticed, there was a traditional uh, pigeon race that uh, was between the shores of Dover and Paris that happened, happened, been happening for centuries. And they had one race uh, and they it usually take some four or five hours or something like that to get across the English Channel and to get to where they need to go. Uh, this particular time, they didn't arrive. They were, they, and when they finally arrived, it was six hours late. So they did some study and found that what had happened during the middle of that race is that was the time that they were flying the supersonic transport across the, the Atlantic between New York and London and that the double boom, boom of uh, the sonic boom of that was probably a cause for these animals getting disoriented. So they're sensitive to pressure. And if they're sensitive to barometric pressure, this guy Douglas Quine did an interesting study with pigeons after that, because it kind of clued him in on it. He found that uh, he had a, a bear chamber. He was able to vary the pressure very slowly with and He found that these animals were able to sense pressure variations that would be as akin to uh, a, a sine wave that would be like one cycle per minute. So they are very sensitive to barometric ch uh, pressure changes. And the, the, the speculation, of course, is that they use this not just to sense, um, you know, when weather fronts are coming through and when they can get up in front of the weather front and have the wind uh, at their tails, but also hearing wind blowing over mountain ranges and different kind of like a bar barometric map. And when we have these uh, pulsing that's happening with these wind farms, is that going to distract migrating birds? Um, we see that some birds like petrels and shearwaters, they avoid these uh, wind farms like the plague. They'll stay 20 kilometers away from them. So it's a bit problematic seeing as these seabirds actually belong out at sea, uh, we may have a problem in front, in 
front of us on that particular front there. And just to give you an idea how big these things are, this until recently was the largest. It was, it's a 14 megawatt generator. And they're gonna go up on poles that are, uh, usually the hub is about 600 feet and the blade will kick that up another 300 feet. So you have, or 350 feet. So you have essentially a thousand foot tall turbine. That is seven, uh, that's 250 feet taller than the Golden Gate Bridge. It's about the, it's about the height of the, I, I know in, in Bill's presentation, he had the, um, the Salesforce Center, uh, Salesforce building there. And, and that's about a thousand feet tall. It's, it's, so those wind turbines are gonna be that tall and they're gonna be out in the ocean. Um, and making various noises. And so this is one of the problems, you know, this is a, there is a paper I can, I'm not sure if you're seeing, I'm seeing this uh, share screen thing, but this is Solana Houghton. Uh, they found that these langoustine who are basically live in the North Sea and they, they basically forage and they bioirrigate the mud up there uh, which keeps it habitable for the, their food, which are, you know, the land worms and amphipods and what have you, those that reside in this fluffed up mud. So these animals are bioirrigating the mud, but they're finding that the noise in the substrate, which is transmitted, is disrupting these animals and they're not fluffing the mud up as much. And now we have a problem because they've been fluffing up the mud since time of memorial and, uh, if that mud is not fluffed up, it's going to turn to concrete. It's going to settle. And it's not going to be good habitat for the vertebrates that live there, which are the foundation of the food chain. So uh, we may have a problem there. Uh, we, we will see. So, um, oh, there's also just in terms of, there's some other studies done in terms of wind farm noise on oysters and scallops. So the invertebrates are being uh, troubled by this noise up there. Um, so that's, that's the West Coast because all this stuff is transmitted, shallow water is transmitted into the mud uh, the, the, on the East Coast. The West Coast is different. We have uh, deep waters, outer continental shelf is 2000 feet before then it drops down from there. And that causes this amazing upwelling, which is really, what makes this coast spectacular for us and why we have all those critters navigating up and down that what Bill was talking about is because there's food and there's just ample amounts of it. These, the wind kind of drives these upwellings that happen and it brings with it all these deep water nutri nutrients, um, zooplankton and uh, phytoplankton and, and things that various animals eat. And so that's, uh, that, that's an amazing component of this coast. But what they're proposing are putting these essentially forests of wind farms out here and transforming this offshore habitat that has been as far back as one ocean and one continent come together. Um, they has been open ocean and now it's gonna be a, a forest of these, these masts and wind farm uh, floating uh, these bases. And they, they use floating bases here because it's too deep to dry piles down. And these are the three kind of characteristic ones. The spar buoy is just a floating buoy and, and uh, it's easy to stabilize. They just have to string these, these uh, anchor wires down, um, but it, they do rock around a bit. And in the ocean, uh, particularly, you know, uh, right there in that, that shelf break, it gets pretty nasty. You get some pretty big swells sometimes. And so these things will, will rock around. One of the ways of stabilizing is they do these semi-submersibles. Now, these are uh, technology that was generated by the oil guys um, to stabilize their um, offshore rigs in deep waters as well. And what these don't have, which the offshore oil guys did have, is a stabilizing propeller. So um, we don't know how animals are going to behave around these. We know that the other ones were noisy and that animals, uh, whales and what have you, would avoid, them, avoid the area. But uh, this is one of the, and the, this, another version is kind of crossed between these two as a tension leg platform. So this is a floating buoyant structure and then they tension it down 
with these straight wires that go down into the substrate. And so those are the three, uh, and this is kind of how they look in conceptual in situ. So you have these anchored masts and uh, platforms, and they will stretch the electrical wire, kind of string them together and then tie it to the shore. So there's a lot of seafloor interference, but I think more to the point that I'm gonna be making in a second is all these wires and cables that are down here uh, are obstacles. And uh, Bill had this, uh, talked about lunch feeding, He's, that piece that he had with um, the tracking the humpback whale feeding. And they go down deep and they lunge feed, which means that they, um, they essentially gather speed, they open their jaw up 90 degrees, they fill the gullet that they have with about as much water as their own body weight is. And then they squish out the, um, whatever they picked up, whether it's pelagic crabs or krill or bait fish, forage fish or what have you, and they'll squish it out through their baleen, the, the, the food that will get stuck in their baleen and that's how they eat. Um, so, I've been concerned about this lunch feeding and how animals are going to work around this stuff. Bureau of Ocean Energy Management put this snappy little video together to ease our fears. And is it coming? This will also give you some physical views of these things. Okay, so you get the idea. This is what it looks like in uh, in real life. This is a, a minke whale. Uh, open ninety degrees. Grab all fish. Yes. Hey, Michael. I just wanted you. That was an interesting uh, video you just showed. But for our radio audience, could you tell them what they were listening to? Oh, yeah. Okay. So it's a snappy little video that the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management put together that shows a mommy and a baby whale, and they're swimming through the uh, wind farm, and she goes down to forage, and she's calmly kind of foraging in and around these cables and, and anchor cables and, and electrical wires and what have you. Well, these cables are, you know, four to six inches in diameter, and we know that forage fish like the aggregator around mid, uh, mysticals. They do it to protect themselves. So what happens when this animal's lunch feeding? The, the lunch feed, they'll accelerate up to six meters a second, which is about a, a kind of a fast jogger, you know, 13 miles an hour, something like that. It, it may be like a fast jogger going 13 miles an hour and hitting a signpost, you know, hitting a, hitting a, a, a fire hydrant or something like that. That, that'll hurt. And when this animal's got its jaw open 90 degrees, what happens if it catches one of these cables on its jaw? Now, these are the lunch feeding whales. It would be the fin whale, the blue whale, 
the minkies, the say whales, if they have it, they don't have a lot of them out here, but, uh, and also the humpback whales. So they all feed that same way. What, what are we gonna find? You know, what are we gonna do if we find that these animals are basically uh, damaging their baleen or worse pulling their jaws off on these things through feeding? And I, 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 the mind boggles. So I, I, that little jaunty video that, that uh, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management put together um, doesn't really quite express what, uh, what may be happening down there. And again, we haven't done offshore, deep water offshore floating wind. They have a farm up in Norway that's been running for a few years, but they don't have the same uh, upwelling there. They don't have the same feeding whales up there. It's mostly just kind of fishing area. So we, we do not know uh, how these animals will behave around this stuff. Well, thank, so, you. thank you for that. I just wanted to, you know, for the radio audience isn't showing the pictures, but that. Yeah. Uh, I hope you found the music snappy. <laughs> what well, we did, we thought, what did he do? <laughs> You're listening. Yeah. Right? Okay, I'll let you get back. Thank you. There you go again. Okay. It's an amazing adaptation. Uh, so, um, so what are our concerns? The turbine operating noise the continuous noise. And uh, this is not just in the water column, but, but transferred down into the substrate and it'll be transferred laterally through all the animals that are living down there. Um, and it's a continuous noise. And we've seen some fairly alarming numbers on how loud the continuous noise is in the water column. Um, and uh, the threshold, the regulatory threshold from National Marine Fishery Services is a 120 dB RA1 micropascal is uh, what they call a level B a harassment thresholds. And these uh, turbines are well above that. And mm -hmm. then you have service vessel noise. So you're going to have vessels going out there and tweaking it and making sure the things are working right, et cetera. So you're increasing the, the traffic significantly in these areas. Uh, these call air, for example, the call area out in, in uh, Morro Bay, I should go back here and, and, get, and give you some mapping on this. This Morro Bay uh, uh, call, that's the Diablo Canyon, we canceled that one out. Morro Bay, that's going to be 400 square miles, and it's going to contain some somewhere upwards of 200, uh, 200 turbines. And then the Humboldt area, uh, development area here, is smaller, I think it's like 350 square miles and they're gonna have fewer turbines, but it's, it's the same, you know, it's the same issue. You see this deep water coming up into this area here. And, uh, you know, this river is coming down this way. Uh, you're gonna have a confluence of, of habitat there that is going to be disrupted. So uh, go back to our bullet points here. So turbine operating noise, service vessel noise, uh, increase in ship strikes, in the sense, something that Bill talked about earlier is that these ships, these particularly larger ships, uh, don't maneuver that well, and sometimes they hit these whales. In fact, we are losing anywhere from 60 to 80 whales a year due to ship strikes off the coast of California. Now, the service vessels will be smaller and maybe more avoidable, um, but we, we, we don't know for sure. We just find out. Then uh, the bird propeller strikes. This is something that is really characteristic with the terrestrial mounted wind turbines where the, the raptors will see something high and they like being up high because it gives them an eye, you know, a, a vantage point to look down and uh, look for their, their, their prey, you know, the gophers or mice or what have you that they're, they're eating. The problem is there's nothing in there uh, imprint on life that has a propeller blade moving at them. And they look like they're moving slow, but if you have a 300 foot propeller blade, that's that's essentially turning at one revel, the whole propeller is turning one revolution every five seconds. The tip velocity on that is over 250 miles an hour. It looks slow, but it's not slow at all. So if that hits a bird, boom. And that's so you, the first turbine that I saw, the terrestrial turbine I saw was up in um, in Holland many, many years ago. And the area around it was littered with kestrels. I mean, literally just four or five, six kestrels is just right there. I just picked them up and, and they were fresh. So they that how this is going to work offshore, 
you know, these are going to be 20 to 30 miles offshore. There might not be so many migratory birds up there. Uh, they certainly don't have any uh, raptors out there. They're all things like uh, cormorants and, and um, guillemots and, and uh, other, other critters that may behave differently around these. We don't know. And uh, then the electromotive force is, a, is an issue where it's finding that certain animals use the magnetic force of the planet, like the, the magnetic field to navigate. Well, we are putting these electromotive uh, cables through this, that, this magnetic field these animals are, are using. Uh, there was a recent paper out that looked at how uh, blue crabs aggregated right around these, these cables. And when they're aggregating on the cables, they're not doing what they are born to do. Uh, is this going to affect uh, tuna migration? We don't know. And as I mentioned before, the barometric noise impacts on bird migration. So those are the kind of the, the concern operating points. And, and because, uh, well, we're doing this in such mass on the eastern seaboard and the western seaboard, uh, or I guess we call it coast area. Seaboard is an interesting word. <laughs> I look at the etymology of that one, um, or history of that word. but. Uh, the, we're doing something we haven't done before, which is deep water floating wind. So uh, we have to take it step at a time and hopefully we have adaptive management plans so that we find out there is a biological problem that we can come up with a, uh, a fix. Because um, we're changing this habitat and we're changing it for the, for, for the foreseeable future. Uh, the next hundred years, I suspect, we'll see wind off, offshore. So um, it's a balance of harms argument. For every uh, watt of uh, power we're generating with wind, we are not generating with fossil fuel. We know that fossil fuel is killing the planet. So we have at least that component to um, the argument. And we're, uh, so we're pivoting away from fossil fuels. And are we migrating into another mare's nest? So we have to take our time. What we're calling for are really robust baselines um, at three the water column, all taxa from invertebrates, um, fish, the um, cetaceans, and the birds above the waterline, um, and just really get an idea before we start sticking this stuff in, what's out there. Now, we, there, there's a lot of data that, because we've been studying this for a long time, there is a lot of data, but there's some stuff that we haven't looked into because it's not necessarily uh, as easy to get, for example, um, funding to fund uh, the acoustic uh, cues of the annelid worm as it is to get the acoustic cues of funding for the acoustic cues of humpback whales. It's the um, charismatic megafauna problem we have. So we're asking for deep baselines. We're asking for uh, continuous observation as the habitat started changing and having adaptive management so that if we see there's a problem, we can put the brakes on and say, hold it, how are we going to solve this problem? So uh, that uh, is another, oh, another component of this. So we have these projections and there's a lot of different projections in terms of how much energy we're gonna be using. Um, and this one here, uh, the green is renewables, blue is natural gas. These are, they're all speculations. But one of the things, and this is the, the, the renewables component to this is a projection up to 2050. But one of the problems that I have with this is that this line always goes up. And one of the things that we're not putting into the equation is using less energy. It probably would not surprise you to understand, I said that the, the uh, semi-submersible technology and the floating offshore floating technologies were developed by the oil and gas people. It probably wouldn't surprise you to know that who is Putting throwing the hats in the ring on this uh, on this technology, Equinor is uh, which used to be Stat Oil is doing a lot of stuff on the eastern coast and out here at Shell and BP. So the oil guys again, and one of their they know how to, to centralize energy distribution. That's what they're good at, and they don't want to let, let go of that particular handle. Um, but if you are, for example, using solar on your rooftop and you're selling your excess energy back to the, the utility company, you know when you're using more than you're generating and you know when you're generating more than you're using. And it, it's a very close 
feedback loop where you can say, wow, if I use less energy, the world's a better place. And what we're, what is being proposed right now in this blue energy, green energy uh, transformation is that we unplug the pipeline and plug in the power cable. And I think we need to have a conservation component in this argument. So that is my presentation. Thank you. And uh, this is my book here. And I guess uh, if there's any questions, I'd be glad to answer in the five minutes remaining here. And I, Thank I you. I'll share my screen. That, that was an excellent presentation. And for those of us who are, you know, right here, uh, as you well know, right here on the Mendocino Coast and uh, hearing about all of these potential um, turbines that might be in our future. We do know there's some, you know, already coming up to Fort Bragg. But, uh, you know, for I'm sort of it's this quandary we're in and this age we're in is it's almost like the old um trope of which devil are you going to choose right you know we're told that we should be driving electric cars but electric cars use lithium batteries and lithium is you know depletes the water system and they're talking about taking lithium off the bottom of the ocean and that's going to be another mining issue you're talking about the wind turbines and you know i mean the birds being struck by blades at 250 miles an hour you know, uh, it, it just all of this, it goes on and on. I mean, you, you've, you've given us some wonderful uh, information that we all have to consider as we go future. And then, but you also ended on how can we change also the way we live? Right. What can we do is the question that comes to our mind uh, here is what can we do to, so we don't have to keep depleting resources or creating alternative uses that sound good, but in the long run are creating a whole nother set of issues. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a lot of solutions that are out there and, and, you know, high speed rail, which is, you know, the oil guys are putting log jams on as much as they can because they would rather burn fuel. But, you know, Toyota is coming out with a hybrid Tundra in 2022. It's like, Oh God, that, that says it all, you know, 4,000 pounds of steel being driven through a battery. I mean, instead of getting nine, nine miles a gallon, it'll get 12. I mean, it's, it doesn't make any sense, but um, high speed rail, it takes 20% of the energy to move somebody across the, the, the country on high speed rail as it does in an airplane. So we need to have more mass transit and less, reliance on having our own little um, vehicles. I mean, I'm in the process of trying to buy an electric car right now, and it's just driving me nuts. It's like, I shouldn't have to do this. I should be able to go out to the train tracks that used to be there in 1963 and take that into town. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. Well, and for rural people, we don't have a choice. You know, we, we, we live far away from anything and we don't have those other alternatives. I wanted to make another comment, though, uh, being radio people, we loved all the, the audio and they you really shared, did, you know, from all the different uh, the, the ocean living creatures. It was just wonderful because it is something that we never think about. You know, that they also are down there. We, we know about the whale songs and whales talking and maybe dolphins and porpoises, but not all the other smaller t creatures and uh, really appreciated hearing that. How did you collect all of that? Yeah, I've been collecting stuff. Where, you know, some recorded myself, but also I've got colleagues in the, in the bioacoustics business who've been recording this stuff. And I've, we have a, a huge sound library. And if you go onto our website, OCR.org, uh, the sound library is on there and we, we're going to start populating with some more stuff, but it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. There's some kid, a lot of kid stuff on there, identifying sounds and uh, matching, uh, matching games and things like that. So our OCR.org website has a lot of uh, features to it that, that uh, kids of all ages can <laughs> enjoy. Well, we, we so appreciate your presentation. We're happy that we can, you know, see it again and listen to it again. And thank you for being part of the symposium for a third year in a row. Uh, it's time for me to find out and for all of our audience to find out what's coming up next. Yes. Yes. Uh, tomorrow. Thanks for the opportunity. And we'll talk to you later. Oh, thank all you. Right. Bye, welcome. Michael. Bye -bye. Yes, Peggy and Leanne tomorrow and our listeners, we have a great lineup. Another fascinating, fabulous day. We have Ted Cheeseman with Happy Whale and also Norma Jellison with the Stewards of the Coast and Redwoods. Then there's 
Sierra, Sarah Grimes with the uh, Noya uh, Center for Marine Science. And that's, the California that's Noyo, Center. Noyo, Noyo Center. Yes, yeah. Center, yes. And then Sarah, Sarah Bogard, Citizen Science, Point Arena Lighthouse. And Cynthia Weigren, uh, Atlantic White Shark Conservancy. It's going to be a great lineup tomorrow. All right. And that's going to do it for the second day of the third annual Ocean Life Symposium. This is KGUA in Wallala, 88.3 FM, streaming around the world live online at kgua.org. We're now going to say goodbye to all of our YouTube watchers, and if you have any questions, you can email them to oceanlifesymposium at gmail.com. Thanks so much for watching and for listening.